Welcome back to Hello County, where we celebrate people, events, places right here, Milwaukee County. And we couldn't be more delighted than to welcome Mr. Reggie Jackson. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Sure, it's a pleasure to be here, Dan. And I uh, don't know if you even, if you even know, because I think a mutual, uh, mutual uh, friend, uh, I'm guessing Angela Quigley, mm -hmm. might be how we managed to, she put you on the radar. Mm -hmm. And you were so kind and generous as she is to say, yeah, I'll give this a shot. We're a brand new network. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're trying to establish, well, we are, this is week 11. <laughs> we are celebrating week 11 here, and we are um, happy to be back with our friends at uh, the Tosa location, 7613 West State Street, Vendetta Coffee, and my coffee is being warmed up, but uh, cheers to cheers to you, and thank you for joining us, and thank you, Vendetta, for hosting us again. Yeah, oh. thanks for the invitation. Now, I see on your LinkedIn, it mentions that you're a senior research researcher at the Redress Movement. Yes. One of many hats. Uh, I'm not familiar with the Redress Movement. Can you tell me a little bit about that to start? Yeah, the Redress Movement is a national organization that came out of the work of Richard Rothstein's book, The Color of Law, which talked about the history of how the government created segregation. And so people asked Richard after the book came out, well, you know, we, we have a clear understanding of how segregation happened. What can we do about it, Richard? And so some friends of Richard got together and decided to start an organization to begin to redress the damage caused by segregation policies and practices. So Redress Movement is about two years old, and they started the movement in three cities to start with Charlotte, North Carolina, mm -hmm. Denver, Colorado, and Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And so I was hired almost two years ago as a member of the research team. Now research sounds to me uh, what, what little I've been able to gather um, once I knew you were going to be joining us today, that uh, research, you've got a long-standing history with researching with uh, and also sharing that research, helping to educate everyone around you. Yes. Um, we thought, you know, I, I was uh, enjoying several things available. Don't you just love YouTube? We're going to be on YouTube later okay. on our channel, Hello County. Like, subscribe, <laughs> check out this guy. And, uh, but one of the, I don't know whose podcast it was or if it was just, you know, COVID and Zoom or whatever, but you were spending a good amount of that particular conversation educating on the pitfalls of gentrification. And in fact, um, I wrote down that uh, you had referenced a book, How to Kill a City, yes. and I didn't catch the author. Yeah, I don't remember the author's name. But we don't need that information to be able to look up that book, How to Kill a City. It was, uh, it, it centered, that particular one centered, uh, reference New York City which I had an opportunity to live in, and, uh, mm -hmm. and co-founder Mark out there is uh, hanging yeah. out in Brooklyn. Yeah, the author uh, grew up in Brooklyn, and so he talked about the changes in his neighborhood from when he was a kid and to what it looks like now, and the gentrification happening there in his neighborhood. I'm doing this because before I left New York, which was right around late 2014, um, the industry I was working for shipped me down to Houston, <laughs> but um, I remembered already joking about Brooklyn, the new Manhattan, mm -hmm. <laughs> the new Brooklyn, the new Midtown, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I was saying that because of the gentrification that was already happening, mm -hmm. and so much, they know to keep me capping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, can you speak to that? Um, sure. And the, uh, the podcast you're talking about is a podcast I did with Tariq Moody at 88.9 radio station mm -hmm. called By Every Measure. It was a six-part series on systemic racism. So one of the segments, we, we, we talked about housing issues. And so that's when the conversation about gentrification came up. And so I, I describe gentrification as a very pretty word for something that's not very pretty because literally... What gentrification is, at its essence, is displacement of poor people. 
and you know the neighborhood may get you know what people call better you know more investment in the neighborhood but that investment is not for people that are there when the investment is taking place it's for people that are going to live there years down the line so what it does is it creates an environment where the ability to stay in your neighborhood becomes very difficult for people because you know housing becomes way more expensive and you generally are going to displace the people that you're supposedly trying to help and move in completely new group of people into those neighborhoods and so the author of the book how to kill a city talks about like kind of two waves of gentrification that happen so the first wave of gentrification are people that are generally working class or middle class that have a little more money than the people in the neighborhoods and eventually as the property values increase, rents increase, you know, all those things. Those people eventually can't afford to live in the neighborhood anymore and they're replaced by people who are generally wealthier. And so it's really, you know, something that we've, we've seen happen in certain communities in Milwaukee over the course of time. We're seeing uh, some gentrification happening just north of downtown because of all of the, you know, the investment in downtown Milwaukee, Fiserv Forum and other things. One of the neighborhoods that's being impacted is a neighborhood called the Halyard Park neighborhood. It's a traditional black neighborhood in Milwaukee. It was founded by a group of black real estate developers who wanted to build what they called a suburb within the city for black people who weren't welcomed out into the suburbs of Milwaukee County. They said, well, let's build a suburb within the city. So they built this very unique neighborhood. They modeled these 42 or 43 houses off of houses in Mequon and Brookfield, and they built a really beautiful neighborhood, big, beautiful houses. Uh, and, you know, everybody there was a homeowner, so there were no renters in the neighborhood. And it was a very unique neighborhood, and they called it Halyard Park because they wanted to honor a black family, the Halyard family, who moved to Milwaukee in the early 1920s and opened Columbia Savings and Loan which ended up being the only lender in town that would lend to black people to get a mortgage for, for, for decades. They were the only mortgage lender that would you know, give black people a mortgage. And so they named it after that, that couple. And so that neighborhood, since the fire Reform forum opened, you know, I know several of the people who live in the neighborhood. You know, parking downtown is very expensive. Some people don't want to pay for the parking. So what they've done is they've kind of walked, you know, walk to neighborhoods set nearby mm -hmm. to find free parking and so they park in people's in front of people's homes in Halyard Park mm -hmm. and you know people that normally wouldn't see those neighborhoods and you know, it's an all black neighborhood they're like looking like well, look at this neighborhood these houses are beautiful mm -hmm. why are we being told to stay away from this part of town it's, it's not dangerous it's, it looks better than where I live and so people started to say well wow I wouldn't mind living here I wonder how much the house is costing so people started buying houses in Hellyer Park. So one resident that I know there talked about her neighbor being offered, this was two years ago, her home. Someone offered her $400,000 for the house. Now the city has assessed that property at about a less, little less than $200,000. So somebody comes along with a check of $400,000, she sells the house. She sells the house. <laughs> And then another neighbor was offered a half million dollars for her house. She refused to sell. She said, this house has been in my family since we built it. We built this house, and we're going to keep it in the family. So she refused to sell her house. But it's one of those things where now the property values in how you're parking increasing dramatically. And most of those people who built the house are either very old or, you know, some of them have passed away now, and the homes are in their families' names. And so... The property values have increased to an extent that the property taxes are really, really high for those people now, and they're, they're struggling to pay the property taxes. And so that's one of those kind of one side of gentrification is that, you know, I, I describe it as a double-edged sword. You know, there, there's some good stuff that comes out of it, but when you look at the flip side of it, it does move people out of their traditional home neighborhoods. And so well, that's one example here in Milwaukee. When I was first, you know, starting to listen to to that podcast and it and the reference to how to kill a city and things like that my first thought even before you had mentioned that that author um, was from New York <laughs> my first thought was the village Greenwich Village you know mm -hmm. it's like it had been you know a bohemian artist uh, 
neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And uh, sure enough, <laughs> uh, within, uh, you know, eventually, again, because the prices were lower, you know, there were these classic old brownstones and things like that, and eventually money started getting pouring in to gentrify the area, and it drove all the uh, starving artists out. Mm-hmm. And then they went to Hell's Kitchen, and now that's in the process of being gentrified. And yeah. now where are you going to go? <laughs> and Well, Brooklyn. But now yeah. that's being gentrified, and now yeah. where are you going to go? And, and when you had said that gentrification is a very pretty word, but there's a flip side to that coin, and that is displacement. Absolutely. You were also talking about... Um, uh, Going to uh, Detroit, Chicago. Dad, well, well my dad, dad lives in Detroit. Right. Going. I did. I did mention Chicago. We're going to come back to that favorite cousin. And mm-hmm. um, but going to Detroit, and um, now, if memory serves correct, what you were sharing was an athletic baseball center stadium was put in, mm-hmm. and that. Near it were many, actually, you were talking about a, a quaint custom of setting fire to an old abandoned building or something? Yeah, there, there's this tradition what, in Detroit. I, I, don't, I don't understand it myself, but um, people set houses on fire for some unknown. I don't know what the reason is. but So when they were building a new oh, Detroit. baseball stadium for the Detroit Tigers team, uh, I was there visiting my father right, mm-hmm. right after the stadium opened. My wife and I were kind of walking around the area. You know, checking it out beautiful stadium and what shocked both of us was that you know just a couple blocks away from the stadium mm-hmm. were these burned up abandoned buildings we're like wow and then across the street from these burned up buildings were new condos that were being built that were like you know at that time these condos were like a hundred and seventy five hundred eighty thousand dollars uh, I know a woman who lives in Detroit she says those condos now are million dollar condos so when my wife and I were in Detroit, that was that was probably close to 20 years ago when we saw these condos. Right. And so it, it was just shocking to us that you had this brand new baseball stadium, beautiful stadium that people come and visit to, you know, to root on the Tigers team. And they have to look at these ugly burned up buildings, you know, just a couple blocks away. And then you have these, these beautiful condos being built. So I knew that. The people that were living in that neighborhood were going to be moved out of that neighborhood. It was going to be a completely different neighborhood eventually. And so that's kind of what happened in Detroit. So there's a part of Detroit in downtown that's called the 7.2. And it's 7.2 square square miles of downtown Detroit that is owned by um, very, very wealthy people. Uh, And one of those wealthy people is Dan Gilbert. Dan Gilbert is uh, one of the founders of Quicken Loans. And he's also uh, okay. <laughs> the owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers basketball team. Uh, and he owns a bunch of real estate in downtown Detroit. Like, I think someone told me he owns like 40 or 50% of all the real estate in downtown Detroit he owns. And so. Real life monopoly. Yeah, real life monopoly. And so, what they were able to do as gentrification was occurring in downtown Detroit. You know, everybody who lives in downtown Detroit now are wealthy people. No regular people live there anymore. And. They're the only ones who can afford to live there. And they have their own security force in the 7.2 district, they call it, that has the same power as the Detroit Police Department has. Wow. No oversight like the police department, but they have the same level of power that the police department has. And they're there to protect, you know, this investment that all these rich people have made in downtown Detroit. And so, you know, I talked to my dad about, you know, downtown Detroit. He says, you know, Regular people don't really hang out in downtown Detroit very much because it's, everything is just too exceptionally expensive there. It's millionaires row. Yeah, and so it's it's very interesting. Which that seems to be a relatively common thing now. Millionaires row. When yeah. I was in Houston, where the bushes mm-hmm. lived and the everything else, and I yeah, I loved going for brunch at one of the nearby places. But mm-hmm. uh, you know, they had their version of. Um, Rodeo Drive and things like that, yeah. and, uh, Millionaire's Row and stuff, but, mm-hmm. which made sense to me for Houston, but uh, now you're seeing it. You're seeing it all over. Now, is that a result of urban planning? Well, the, these things are a result of 
investments that cities make in their communities where they invest in certain neighborhoods and ignore other neighborhoods. So they disinvest in some neighborhoods and invest in other neighborhoods. Uh, another uh, city that the author talked about in the book is San Francisco. You know, San Francisco is considered the most expensive city in the country to live in right now. To this day, okay. It's like it's holding it, holding ridiculously <laughs> expensive. And what's happened over the course of time, the gentrification in San Francisco has pushed regular average everyday people out of the city. They can't afford to live there. So people who are teachers, police officers, firefighters can't afford to live in San Francisco anymore. So they're moving further away from the city to places like Richmond, California and to Oakland, California. Mm -hmm. And as a result of people leaving San Francisco moving to Oakland, Oakland's become more expensive and people who live in Oakland are being forced to move even further away right. from from you know their homes in Oakland, California. So it's kind of a a ripple effect where mm -hmm. you know the one city is impacted but it impacts you know cities that are fairly close to it because the people that are displaced eventually displace people in other communities and so it's it's really something that I think is quite interesting and what people don't generally understand about development so when you see development happening in you know any any big city you pick there the plans for development uh, are long-term plans. Right. People don't just, you know, all of a sudden come up with an idea today and then tomorrow they start working on it. These are things that are, you know, long-term plans, 15, 20-year plans before you finally see the results of it. And so by the time you see the results of all of the, the stuff that's happening in downtown Milwaukee, all the development you're seeing, these are things that people were talking about many, many years ago. And, and Even decades in some cases, Decades right? ago, yeah decades ago and so people don't know about these you know meetings taking place that was your free people are talking graphic about. that you had yeah. on the one podcast yeah yeah you know i i, I describe gentrification as like a it's a freight train you, you see it coming but you're not going to stop it you know the powers that be people who have billions of dollars if they want something in this country they generally get it and so that's what you see with these developers they're making so much money and they love money, so they want to keep making more and more money. And so they're taking over more and more, you know, cities, doing these developments, pushing people out, and reaping the rewards of it. I mean, I personally don't have anything against making a lot of money. I don't have it. I've not figured out how to do it yet, but I, I'm, not, I'm not opposed uh, inherently to it. I am opposed to, like, the old robber barons that made so much money off the backs of the employees, or in this case, uh, a gentrified neighborhood where you squeeze out the people who were there, <laughs> you know, in order to come in and do, do whatever. I do, I do take issue with that. I had a question for you, Reggie. Yeah, sure. You, you kind of mentioned San Francisco and, and it becoming too expensive for, you know, the firefighters and other municipal workers and, and things to work there. And I mean, it's been like that down. for quite a while at this point now, right? Yeah. And I guess my question was, how do you think about the role of, uh, like, zoning laws or restrictions on development uh, that kind of exacerbate these problems, potentially, in the sense that... You know, I, my understanding of like for San Francisco in particular, it's very hard to build anything. Um, and if you wanted to build a, a giant, you know, apartment building, that would you encounter a lot of obstacles. But one way to one way to make it more affordable would be to have more housing just in general in those areas. I, I didn't know how you kind of thought about that compared to development and uh, the implications there. Yeah, you know, zoning laws are really incredibly important part of how development takes place in cities. Mm -hmm. That's why I was saying, you know, when these developments happen, uh, part of it is the fact that people, general, you know, Americans don't really care or know anything about zoning laws and how zoning takes place and creates pockets of development in some places and disinvestment in other places. You know, zoning laws play a big role in that. And so when you look at places like San Francisco, or Brooklyn, or Detroit, or even downtown Milwaukee, zoning changes really have impacted, you know, where the development takes place in these communities. Zoning laws, so... And who ends up being, in, I mean, that's a governmental 
branch, right? Zo- I mean, yeah, zoning. Zone, yeah, zoning is zoning. And generally so controlled by local, in, the local government. In yeah. office, the city government are yeah. the ones that have the most sway. Yes. I'm assuming. Like the Milwaukee th- Department of City Development yeah. is involved. I just think of like, you know, the classic um, in San Francisco. Where where did uh, Full House was that the show with Bob Saget take place? Yeah, there's uh, yeah. there's four like very uh, unique. Uh, homes there and I bet but well, one idea would be to knock those over and actually build huge apartment towers um, but I think you would get a lot of pushback against kind of these historic buildings right but that would be a, I don't know one way to alleviate these kind of like cost pressures would just to be build a lot more uh, apartments and, and homes for people to live in and kind of densify it or something but yeah, you know one of the, the aspects of zoning that plays a really important role in a lot of cities is that you know, places are zoned in such a way that they restrict the types of homes that you can build. Are you talking redlining by chance? No, this isn't redlining. This, these are just zoning principles that, for instance, here in, in Milwaukee County, uh, you know, a lot of the suburbs of Milwaukee have zoning laws that say that you can only build, you know, uh, a certain type of house. Single family know. homes or something. They have to be a certain size and a certain acreage. And so what, what happens is it increases the cost of building a home in those communities. And so that makes it so that, you know, people who don't have the means to afford building a really big home will never buy a home in those communities. And so it's, it's, it's a, one it's tool. It's a non-starter. Yeah, it's, it's a tool to, to make sure that uh, a community stays in a certain economic strata in terms of people living there because you know with these zoning laws in place that only people with a certain amount of money can build that particular type of house. And so it's a way of keeping certain people out. How does that compare with um, redlining? Well, redlining is something completely different. Redlining, uh, the term redlining is, uh, is actually a misnomer. I tell people all the time that, you know, people talk about the redlining, you know, redlining maps. The maps that people are referring to are maps that were drawn by the federal government. Uh, the first of those maps were drawn in 1934 through 1940 by a federal government agency called the Homeowners Loan Corporation. And the maps had color codes to determine, you know, the feasibility of people insuring mortgages in those neighborhoods. And so they have four colors, green, blue, yellow, and red. And so those areas that were red were considered to be hazardous areas for you know, insuring a mortgage. And so if you lived in one of those red areas, then the chances of getting a mortgage were almost, you know, completely zero. You could get one, but it would be exceptionally difficult. And the mortgage terms, depending on the color of the area that you lived in, you get the best uh, mortgage if you live Mm -hmm. in the the green and blue areas. Mm -hmm. So if you lived in one of those red areas, for instance, in Milwaukee, the map that was drawn for Milwaukee County in 1938, there were, I think, 16 areas that were that were colored red on the map, but they weren't all colored red because of who lived there. Oftentimes, they were colored red because you look at, you know, the condition of the community. So if you had older parts of the city where mm-hmm. the housing was really old and raggedy, or there weren't, you know, sewage systems, you know, put in place old raggedy factories polluting the air and the water, those areas would be red on those maps. Mm. But there were certain neighborhoods in Milwaukee that were red line because of the people that lived there because as the FHA kind of took over the ownership of those maps and drew those maps, and they referred to those maps as residential security maps, they specified that an area could be hazardous or colored red if there were what they refer to as inharmonious racial and ethnic groups in those neighborhoods. And so those inharmonious racial groups always included black people. And depending on, you know, which city you go to and certain places that included Asian Americans, particularly out west in places like, you know, Northern California, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oregon, Washington. uh, uh, One of the inharmonious racial groups in Milwaukee were later arriving Jewish immigrants Mm -hmm. from southern and eastern Europe who were later arriving Jewish immigrants to the city. They were considered to be an inharmonious racial group. Uh, Mexicans were considered an inharmonious racial group in Milwaukee. Polish people were considered an inharmonious racial group in the map for Milwaukee as well. 
Which leads me to our community chat. Don, Don, who's been with us since day one, asked this question. Reggie, do you think the buildings that were burned, oh, do you think that buildings were burned to lower the value so then people would come in, save the day, you know, get credit, making it better, plus they make the profits as well as on the backs of the black community. So she's actually kind of hearkening back, I think, to when we were talking a little bit about uh, Detroit. Yeah, yeah, you know, I don't understand the dynamic of, of the buildings being burned in Detroit. You know, I've, I've asked people and nobody seems to have an explanation. So I, I really don't know okay. if that played a role in it or not. I wish I did. It's a good theory, though. <laughs> <laughs> but also, it, it also made me think of, uh, you had made a comment, and I don't remember exactly which neighborhood, but uh, you were you were out, not, not Terrace, well, uh, you were out in California, a uh, suburb of a suburb, <laughs> San Francisco area, I think, um, and you happened to know someone who had purchased a lot of parcels uh, here in Milwaukee, and you had commented that, you know, again, yeah. a lot of people don't even realize that there are a yeah. good share of in you know property land investors that yeah. aren't in yeah. Wisconsin, and of yeah. course that's that's that, not breaking any rule. Yeah, in that, that city itself. was Torrance, California. And the reason I mentioned Torrance is because I used to live in Torrance, California. When I got out Torrance. of the Navy, mm-hmm. uh, I stayed in California. Once I got out of the Navy, I lived in Torrance, California, for about are you four in the Navy? years. Yeah, I served in the Navy for six years. Ben's a submariner. And and when I got out of the Navy, I, I decided to stay in California. I lived in Torrance. And so uh, a couple years ago, when I started looking at the growth of corporate landlords in Milwaukee Ooh. and who these people were and where they were from, That's I noticed a lot of corporate landlords. Yeah, a lot of these folks. Yeah, a lot of these folks were people from Torrance, California, New York City, that owned property in Milwaukee. And these corporate entities, they target cities like Milwaukee because they know two things that are really good for them. Number one, they look for communities that are poor, where the, the price of homes is pretty cheap. They can buy the house very cheap, but they know that they can charge pretty high rents in those neighborhoods. And so they've targeted in Milwaukee, they've targeted the north side of Milwaukee, uh, you know, black neighborhoods in Milwaukee. So I, I actually uh, worked with um, a researcher from Market University, John Johnson, who has been looking at the growth of these corporate landlords in Milwaukee over a number of years, and I kind of looked at the, the top five or six of them, and I mapped, you know, where they bought properties. And so when I created these maps, I noticed something that stood out to me. First of all, almost all of the properties they're buying are in the black part of Milwaukee. Mm-hmm. Nothing in the Hispanic part of Milwaukee nothing in the you know whiter parts of Milwaukee, like the southwest side of Milwaukee. Nothing there, nothing on the east side. It's all in, in the central part of the city and the northwest side of the city. So they're focusing on those neighborhoods specifically. And the impact that they've had is that these corporate landlords historically across the country have a record of being much quicker evictors of people who are renters from them. Uh, and they have a record of not being as careful about maintenance on the part the places that they own so you know people complain that you know the furnace isn't working properly things that nature they're not as quick to come in and and make those repairs Mm -hmm. they they generally have according to john i think he said that they have a much worse much worse record than you know homegrown landlords when it comes to you know violations from the city you know, Department of Neighborhood Services, violations for, you know, things that need to be repaired that aren't repaired. And so that's one element of it. And the other element is that they come in, they have so much money, Deb, that they come in and they make cash offers on these homes. So regular average people who want to become a homeowner Mm -hmm. and they find a home that they really like and they're like, well, let's make an offer. And then, you know, they get a call from the realtor the next day that, well, somebody came in with a cash offer. And they can't compete. They, they can't make a cash offer. And they end up losing the house. And so houses that are somewhat affordable for average, everyday, regular Milwaukeeans end up you know, being purchased by the thousands by these people that don't live in Milwaukee, don't really care about Milwaukee. Right. They just want to 
purchase homes and it's, rent them it's out. It's purely profit and make, margin make, investment. Make, yeah, make large driven. amounts of money. One company in particular, uh, in 2022, they bought 833 homes in Milwaukee. I'm Vi- sorry, Vinebrook 800 homes, and 833 homes in Milwaukee. All of them on the one north side. swoop by a corporation. Yep. Over the course of that year, they bought 833 homes in Milwaukee, and they own over 2,000 in the city today. Vinebrook Homes is the name of that company. They're one of the big five. Um, and so these corporate landlords have really, during the time that interest rates were really, really low and people were excited about you know trying to get a mortgage because they were very inexpensive, mm-hmm. a lot of people were shut out of home ownership because of that. Because they couldn't compete with these cash offers. Uh, David, David, uh, well, I think David did slay Goliath, but uh, took some doing. Um, I was curious, we were doing some headlines this morning, and I saw this article under the, the business insert, and it was under the uh, philanthropy section, and it says, donation helps push museum towards goal, and I was curious if this was the museum that you were referencing or if it was a different museum I know there are a lot of fine museums in Milwaukee um, that that is going to experience this this other gentrification where you know at first blush it seems kind of nice oh uh, there's a sports facility or oh look a pretty museum the old ones falling down Mm -hmm. but then ultimately what ends up happening is that that wave after wave of displacement? I was. Yeah, I don't yeah. know so if that the, was the new of location them. of the the new uh, Milwaukee Public Museum is going to be just north of the Five Surf Forum. So this is an area that's just south of of the neighborhood I mentioned earlier, oh, okay. the Howard Park neighborhood, and that will continue to increase the property values in that mm-hmm. area, and hurt the people that are trying to keep their home in the Howard Park neighborhood. Got it. So those are kind of. It, it seems like there's. The gentrification slash displacement is a bit too twofold. One that there's just big money Goliath. <clears throat> we like it, take it, push it out. Then there's the one where again at first blush it looks like, oh well here's this you know all of these burnt literally burned out buildings near the new sports facility. You know gentrification is going to level those and put something nice in its place, but they will. People yeah. in the adjacent area won't be able to afford, afford to move in. Yeah, so it really changes the, the dynamics of neighborhoods very, generally pretty quickly. Um, I know that area in Detroit near the Tigers uh, baseball stadium, mm-hmm. uh, that's been a historically black neighborhood for many years. And not far from that neighborhood is a public housing complex there. Okay. And that public housing complex doesn't exist anymore. Gone. They got rid of it completely. Just got rid of it. So all of those people that were there were, were moved somewhere else. Who knows where they ended up going to in the city of Detroit? Yeah. But you know, how does the how how does something like that compare to your favorite cousin's uh, Chicago West neighborhood? It sounds like that's been more of a slow burn, if you will, with the yeah. process, the turning over, the infiltration, the yeah. pushing out. Yeah. So. Um, a lot of my family, uh, once they left Mississippi years ago, they moved to Chicago. And one of my mother's aunts purchased a home on the west side of Chicago mm-hmm. back in the, I believe in the late 60s. And so when she passed away, her daughter ended up becoming the owner of the home. And, and that, that neighborhood on the west side of Chicago, you know, I love going to visit my cousin. She's one of my favorite cousins. She's like hilarious. And you can give her a shout out. You know, yeah, her name is Carolyn. And, you know, I always loved going to visit with her, mm-hmm. despite the fact that the neighborhood wasn't a very safe neighborhood. You know, it was a neighborhood that had issues with, with, you know, gangs yeah. Yeah. for many, many years. Uh, yeah. But I was never afraid of the neighborhood, even though uh, a couple of my cousins were murdered on that block. So maybe you should have been afraid. Um, I, I was never afraid. Okay. It, it wasn't something. <laughs> I, I know that generally people are murdered by people they know. Nobody in that neighborhood knows me, so the chance of me being murdered by somebody in the neighborhood are pretty slim. So, you know, I would go and visit her. And, you know, my wife, the first time my wife went, went with me there, she, she thought it was kind of sketchy and kind of a scary place because she'd heard me talk about my cousins, right, right. you know, getting murdered there. And so she was a little scared. 
And I'm like, Venus is nothing to be afraid of. It's, it's okay. We'll be safe. And nobody's going to bother us. And so over the course of time, that neighborhood, which was all black neighborhood and has been for decades, I started to notice changes in the demographics in the neighborhood. Uh, back in the 90s, I started to notice uh, a lot more Hispanic people moving into the neighborhood. Uh, and then that kind of slowed down and just kind of disappeared. And now, the last couple of years I visit my cousin here, uh, I noticed right away that at the end of the block, they built this, this beautiful um, uh, wellness center, big, beautiful building, wellness center, you mm -hmm. know, with mm -hmm. yoga classes and, you know, stuff like that. Yoga, I'm like, I bet. <laughs> I, I don't think that, you know, the people that are living in this neighborhood are really interested in yoga. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they built this, this, this beautiful place. And then I started to notice, as I would visit her, something I'd never seen in the neighborhood was white people living on the block. I'd never seen a single white person in the neighborhood in all these years I've been visiting my cousin here. And I started to see white people walking, you know, walking their dogs. And, and then, you know, my cousin told me, oh, yeah, a lot of white people are, are buying houses on the block now and rehabbing the buildings. I mean, big, beautiful houses. They're rehabbing the buildings. And I was really like, my goodness, this is, this is like bizarre. This is a neighborhood that white people would have been terrified of years ago. But now they're buying the houses on this block. And the last time I visited with her um, was back in the spring. And she told me that almost every house on her block now is owned by white people. And most of these black people that have owned these houses, you know, been in their families for generations, have sold their house because these people offered so much money for the houses. Okay. They've tried to buy her house, but she refused to sell it. She said, this is my mom's house. I'm never going to sell my mom's house. But she could make a pretty penny if she did sell the house, but she's refusing to do so. Okay. Most of the people on the block, on both sides of the street, have sold their homes. And you see some very wealthy white people that are now living on the west side of Chicago in a neighborhood that they would have never set foot in, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Sure. And it, it's just another sign of, you know, gentrification because mm -hmm. they're buying the houses. And the people that have been my, my cousin's neighbors that she, she grew up with, you know, those people are, are leaving the neighborhood, you know. Mm -hmm. every, every other day somebody is packing up and leaving. So a lot of the people that were her neighbors that she knew really well, they're gone. They're not there anymore. And so she has all of these new neighbors. Uh, and it's really just kind of strange to see this neighborhood mm -hmm. uh, look so different than it looked mm -hmm. before. And, you know, I, I think many people would look at that and say, well, you know, uh, these people that are that are you know rehabbing these homes, they're making the block better, Reggie. Well, the, the previous uh, owner is getting a nice chunk of change. It's not like they're losing the home per se. I mean, maybe maybe it's economically driven because now the property value and the and the taxes being assessed are are uncomfortable or not really doable. They're older. They're whatever. But at least they are, you know, reaping the reward of the equity that skyrocketed and whatever. But well, that that was actually led to one of the questions I wanted to ask: um, Is it 100% a bad thing when an area gentrifies? Is well, there any? I, I think it depends on your perspective about gentrification. So, in the eyes of many people, you know. Development is always a positive thing. I'm, I'm not a person who agrees with it because I love development if it's going to be something that's going to help the people that live there now. Mm -hmm. I don't like it if it's going to help the people that are going to displace those people that are living there right. now. So I don't want to see a neighborhood transition and then everybody that lives in the neighborhood are gone right. because that doesn't make any sense. You're not helping the people that are that are the residents that neighborhood, you're displacing them with new people. Mm -hmm. And so you're changing the dynamics. And generally when gentrification happens, it's, it, it, the demographic shifts are usually from black people, Hispanic people, to white people moving into a neighborhood. Right. Which, you know, I don't have a problem with that. But I think that what we have to understand is that people, you know, that are displaced are people that have been long-term residents of these right. neighborhoods, you know, for generations in their families. They've owned these homes, and 
you know, there's a connection to the neighborhood. You know, there's there's a connection to the community that is broken, permanently broken when these families are, are you know, displaced. And that, that to me is what hurts the most, mm-hmm. is to see the communities become fractured mm-hmm. because uh, the people that were very close-knit community, mm-hmm. you know, are no longer, you know, a close-knit community anymore because, you know, people are gone that they know. Right. Well, yeah, from the, from the point that your, that your aunt built the home that your cousin inherited, right? And when your aunt built the home, you know, it was community. It was, you know, you knew, you knew your neighbors. The kids all grew up together and played and whatever. Everyone went to school and lived, lived their best life. And now this, this, this whole, whole situation has been redone. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned that some states, not Wisconsin, but some states uh, offer um, the grandfather uh, property tax or something like that. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, one of the challenges that elderly residents have, like many of the people in Hallier Park, that are elderly, you know, they're on fixed income now, you know, they're collecting Social Security maybe a pension if they're lucky. And as their property values increase, the property taxes increase, and because they're on a fixed income, they can't afford the, right. the shifts in the property taxes. So some cities have- Which happen all over. Yeah, all over the country. Anywhere that sees so property taxes one, one of the up. One of the things that people do as a solution to help people in situations they develop, and there's one in Milwaukee and a couple of neighborhoods, uh, uh, anti-displacement fund, which will give people some financial assistance to pay, you know, what they can't afford to pay and in increase property taxes. In some cities, they've tried to implement a program where they'll put a freeze on property tax. They'll grandfather the property taxes into a set rate so that they don't increase, so that these people don't get displaced. Uh, and some states allow that to happen. Wisconsin, under Wisconsin state law, Would you can't do that. No, 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 no. And someone. Uh, that's a friend of my mother's told me that in Mississippi, uh-huh. once you reach 65, I think is the age, that you, you no longer have to pay property taxes. I don't know if that's true. This is something Sounds that my mother's wonderful. friend told me. <laughs> but, you know, it helps, it helps, you know, older people because it's like once you get to a certain age, you retire, you're not, you're not well, working again, anymore. Well, fixed income, typically. fixed income. And, and you're talking pillars of a community. Right. You're talking people who paid their, their tax bill for decades, and yeah, I think I think that should be entertained as, as, as just in general, you know, to consider doing that. Um, Don was uh, asking the question, how how do you recommend to help them? Uh, I I believe she's referencing the displaced communities, um, and she goes, so if they sell their home for a huge profit, first it helps people prosper. And the neighborhood, yes, the neighborhood changed, but the residents benefited from selling, which I was kind of going down that road. But what I think you had already sort of addressed it and can address it again for Dawn's sake, um, that yes, that's all fine and well that they got a, a, you know, a, a big payout for their home. Maybe they didn't want to leave. Right. <laughs> but you they know. could no longer afford to stay. And, and, it's, and it's truly... You know, like uh, like you were talking the neighborhood not too far from Pfizer Forum, right? Where where it's like, you know, people are being pushed out just economically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you know, you know. I, and I don't know. Here I'm like oh, trying yeah, to sure. answer on your behalf. And you know, I, I I would my response to that would be, you know, I think as Americans we think that you know a big check is like the end all be all, but you know, uh, as I said, I think it fractures neighborhoods, it fractures communities because. A neighborhood like Halyard Park is a very close-knit community. You know, these 40-some homes were built by a group of people who got together and said, let's build a suburb within the city. Mm-hmm. Like they all knew each other. Mm-hmm. They've all, you know, lived with each other in this yeah, very small homes, neighborhood. That's an intimate community. Over, over decades. And so, you know, those people have built a community, a very unique community. I don't think there's another community like Halyard Park anywhere in the Everybody, country. Yeah. And so... The fabric of that is that listen, this is something that we have. This belongs to us. You know, we built it from the ground up. You know, 
they started building these houses in the late 70s and the last one was built in the early 90s and so it's just a very close-knit community of people that you know love the neighborhood because they see it as like you know this is our legacy this neighborhood is our legacy mm -hmm. and now for people to come in and be displaced and the people that are selling the houses are generally not the people that built the houses it's you know they've now passed on and now their children their grandchildren may own the house and you know this is grandmama's house somebody's offering me four hundred thousand dollars for it okay grandmama isn't here anymore let me go ahead and get this money so you know it's it's kind of a weird situation but i think it's very sad because it it breaks up the fabric of that neighborhood I, I, that makes so much sense and, and not only grandma's house but that to me also dovetails a little bit with um the the overall milwaukee post manufacturing boom scenario right it, it, it's a factor that feeds into it so the, the the, the 40, peop the 40 uh, families that built these homes were potentially, theoretically, I'm guessing because I don't know firsthand, but likely part of the, you know, they, they had maybe the good, job, the, the good manufacturing jobs and things like that. You know, they created the suburb within and, mm -hmm. and um, you, know, you know, they had the, 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 the family sustainable income streams. And then as the generations go by and the, and the jobs leave and, and other factors that you spoke to in, in one of your other, um, um, well, you, you have so many hats, but this is kind of the economic hat, right? Where, um, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, I suspect it dovetails a little bit with things like that, that not only yeah. is it just that it's, you know, the grandchild, you know, it's like, well, I didn't build it, grandma built it, but the grandchildren are now in a situation where they're not they're not better off you know we like to think that as we build and have our communities that we leave leave, leave a better situation for those that come after us but it's been tilted mm -hmm. in Milwaukee right yeah um, I just want to make sure oh and we're we're actually gonna we're gonna finish out what's in our chat and then we're gonna take a little break Okay. And catch her breath and rehydrate and all that good stuff. So Dawn did specify things. She goes, uh, if I can afford to stay, uh, I would have to, s wait. Oh, if I can't afford to stay, I would have to sell my home and eventually move into senior housing. Um, that, is, that is her situation. Mark also said, uh, sounds, sounds like this is about three groups. The owners who do well when they sell the owners who don't want to leave but see their taxes go up and the renters who can no longer afford to live there well these houses in Halyard Park none of them are occupied by renters they're all homeowners all owners that was that was part there. of the rationale for building that that particular community was that they wanted a, a neighborhood of homeowners everybody was a homeowner nobody rented their homes out not a single family rented their homes out they were all owner-occupied homes, okay. all 42 homes. And that was part of the what made the neighborhood special for those folks is that we know that everybody's a homeowner. And so, you know, generally people who are homeowners are going to take better care of property than somebody who's a renter. Mm -hmm. And so that was part of what made the neighborhood very cohesive. Like, you know, we know that the person next door on both sides of us are going to take care of their property. And our property values are going to, you know, stay at a certain level because right. we don't have renters. You know, when you have people that are renters, and, you know, many people rent simply because they can't afford to purchase a home. Mm -hmm. It's not bad to be a renter. But what it does is when you have a neighborhood that's full of homeowners, mm -hmm. that neighborhood is typically a neighborhood that's going to prosper right. over a long period of time. And this is how families build generational wealth. Because, you know, you keep that home, you build equity in that home mm -hmm. as you're paying it down. And now you have the ability to borrow and set equity, you know, to, to get money, to pay off debts that you have, to make repairs on the home. You know, send your children off to post-secondary education without them getting, you know, a boatload of, of debt. So there's so many benefits to being a homeowner. And, you know, this is how American families traditionally build, you know, generational mm -hmm. wealth. 
because most wealth in American families is in ownership of a home. And I've always said this, that, you know, equity is only valuable if you borrow against it. You know, you can have $200,000 in equity, but if you don't borrow against it, then it's not doing anything for you. Correct. Or unless you sell a house, the equity really means nothing to you. Right. So for people who want to keep their homes, they don't really care about the equity part, but they want to keep that piece of property in their families over more and more generations because this is what a lot of families do you know they'll buy a house and they'll pass it down to their children mm -hmm. or their grandchildren and they know that over generations their family will have this property that mm -hmm. they built and, the, and to me that's very special right? that's something to hold part on to the American to. dream right that, that's on that note we are going to take a quick break but please stay tuned because there's so much more to come I believe there's a book in process in, in the works. There's a, a, a book in the pipeline for you. Yes. Does it have a working title yet? Yes, it does. You want to tell us what that is? Yeah. So the book is about the history of segregation in Milwaukee. So the title of the book, and I've just started working on it this summer, is Midwest Nice Apartheid, How Milwaukee Became the Most Segregated Community in the United States. If you don't c tune back in after that title, I, I, I don't understand it at all. So I know that you will. So uh, on that note, Dan, please take us out for a tiny break, but stay tuned for more of our guest, Re Reggie Jackson. Welcome back. This is Hello County. Don't forget to like and subscribe on YouTube where you're obviously going to want to share the link with uh, today's guest, Reggie Jackson, and an interview. This is part two, by the way, of the interview. If you are just tuning in on our website, hellocounty.com, where, by the way, when people uh, register on, on the website, this is where we do the live broadcasting from the website. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, it is there and only there that if you register, you can join the community chat and have the direct uh, real-time interaction. Mm -hmm. It's uh, quick, it's easy, it's free. But people can also log on, hellocounty.com. Just, you know, click on the links and enjoy the interview or the broadcast. Now, Mark did also chime in when we were on break that in a neighborhood of owners, it sounds like the issue is the first seller in the neighborhood, not the buyers or the government, if you would like to chime in and elaborate one way on, yeah, his, absolutely. on his thoughts. Well, I, the issue with that way of thinking is that the market for those homes is not created by the sellers, it's created by the buyers. People who are willing to pay in whatever amount, they create the market. And, you know, with the property taxes increasing in those communities, that puts pressure on those people who live in the neighborhoods about whether or not they can afford to stay there. And that pressure will often put them in a position where they're gonna sell the house that they don't really wanna sell because they're like thinking, I can't afford to live here anymore. Well, yeah, so the their market property values are creeping, so their property taxes keep creeping and mm -hmm. eventually they're priced out of their home. Absolutely. Or, or their generational home, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, so, you know, the, 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 the person I talked about earlier that sold that home in Hellier Park for $400,000, they literally made everybody in the neighborhood very upset because they're like, this neighborhood has been owned by this, this 42 families that built the neighborhood, and now we have you know, somebody else owning you know, a part of our neighborhood, and they were not happy with that person. So you know, oftentimes, it, you know, that's a good point about the first seller. They, they can be problematic, but you know, there's always reason behind why ever that family sold the house. But the market, wasn't created by that seller. The market was set by buyers who come in, swoop into those neighborhoods and buy up the houses. I just, I just in my, in my head, I, I see vultures. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Vultures just circling around a dying or struggling neighborhood and just waiting to swoop in. Speaking of such neighborhoods, um, it will get a little emotional, but talk about the neighborhood that you were a part of here in Milwaukee. Yes, yeah, so the neighborhood that I spent most of my childhood in is uh, right in the heart of the 53206 zip code on 14th, just north of Bird Lodge Street. 
in a home that we lived in from the time I was in fifth grade all the way till I graduated from high school. Uh, a house that really, I love the house. I love the neighborhood. Beautiful neighbors, you know. It was a very close-knit community. You know, all of the, the people in the neighborhood had pretty good jobs, you know. Manufacturing jobs are still very abundant. So people working at A.O. Smith and American Motors and, you know, you know, pap, Paps and Slits and places like that. So it was a very stable neighborhood because people had good incomes. So it was very rare for new people to move into the neighborhood. You reference family supporting. Yeah, family, family supporting, supporting wage jobs. incomes, yeah, wages, yeah. et cetera. I, and, you know, I like that. So as long as people had family supporting wage jobs, mm -hmm. the neighborhood remained a stable neighborhood. But, you know, those manufacturing jobs started to disappear. Uh, throughout the 70s, Milwaukee lost a lot of manufacturing jobs, and it accelerated in the 1980s. There was a huge recession that most people don't remember from 1981 through 1982, mm -hmm. which at the time was the biggest recession since the Great Depression. And a lot of manufacturing jobs left Milwaukee, and they continued to leave Milwaukee you know, even after that recession. And so that neighborhood that I grew up in, it was such a beautiful place to grow up in. Uh, completely changed and so I'll occasionally go back over to my old neighborhood you know to visit friends that still live there mm -hmm. and it's very sad to see the condition of the block that I grew up on you know uh, I was driving there back in 2018 mm -hmm. and I, it, it it dawned on me that I should write about my neighborhood the block that I grew up on to explain to people what happened to that block how it went from a wonderful block to live on to being a block that's just a very distressed block I mean, right it's now. It's not even, it's barely recognizable to you now. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know. My I, understanding is you and your brother had had to keep the, uh, the grass a certain, yeah, no, I, and now it sounds like it was competition for another neighbor. Yeah, you know, we had very competitive <laughs> neighbors. A man lived across the street from us. You know, he had he had like his his lawn looked like a golf course, right. and so my mother was not going to allow us to have wow, a lawn yeah, that didn't look nice. Yeah. You know, our lawn never looked as nice as his. But you know, he, he was retired, and you know, he had a lot of time on his hands. He was always out in his yard doing work. But we had to keep our our lawn in good 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 condition, as did everybody else on the block. You know, you felt like you didn't want to be the people with the bad looking lawn. Right. And so. When I go over there now, and I went over there in 2018 one day, I was driving past, and I looked, and the grass in that yard was like two feet tall. I'm like, these people are not even cutting the grass. And then when I drove like around the back of the house and looked down the alley, that I used to spend a lot of time riding my bike up and down this alley, mm -hmm. there was trash everywhere. I mean, just piles and piles of trash for people who probably don't even live in the neighborhood are just dumping stuff. It's like people come and just dump oh. trash. And the city has done nothing to clean up the trash. And it made me think about, like, wow, what's going on with this neighborhood? Mm -hmm. And then there were boarded up houses. And did you say that that particular neighborhood was composed of about 23 homes, give or take? Yeah, it's about, yeah. it's currently about 23 homes on that block. And when you were growing up, everyone yeah, it, it, it owned was, their home. Well, not everyone owned the homes. A lot of people were renters, but everybody okay. took care of the, you know, the properties that they lived in. And uh, so when I went over there, there were, I think, seven boarded up houses on the block. Uh, there were five vacant lots on the block. And that was like something I never saw as a kid. Never saw a boarded up house it ever. It looked completely foreign. Yeah, it, it, it looked like a different, a completely different place. And so I decided to, to look into, you know, the value of that block that I grew up on. And so I looked at the city assessor's office mm -hmm. for every home on the block combined together the value assessed value of that entire block was four hundred thousand dollars for the entire block i mean can you imagine that and you know as i would meet people who live in the suburban communities around milwaukee and i would tell them that my whole old block is worth four hundred thousand dollars they would tell that me was about 2018 it was in 2018 they would tell me that their house is worth like more than my old block I'm like, yeah, that, that should tell you something about the difference between the suburbs and the that city. should tell you something. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. One house in a suburban community worth more than the entire block that I grew up on. And I love that block. I tell people I, would, I wouldn't trade my childhood for anybody's childhood. You know, we, didn't, we never really me, had much money. Can you tell me, well, because we were, we were uh, on our break, but can you tell our, our viewers 
the basketball court story? Yeah, so my brother and I <laughs> love basketball. You know, it's the early 70s when, you know, shortly after the Bucks had won their first championship. And, you know, we're big Bucks fans. And so my brother and I wanted to build our own basketball court at the house. And so we found this big Rex hanging a piece of wood. And we, we painted it white. And, you know, we, we got a, 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 a rim from a bicycle and we nailed it on. And that was our basketball goal. You know, and we painted it red, white, and blue. Nice. With my initials in one corner and my brother's initials in the other corner. So it was our first basketball hoop mm -hmm. in our house, right? And so we had a man who, who worked you know, as a, as a trash collector, lived right down the alley from us, mm -hmm. and he saw us playing on this, and he went out on his route, and he found a real basketball goal with a backboard and the rim, and he brought it, and he, you know. He, like regulation he, size Yeah, regulation, kind of thing. absolutely. Real and, deal. Yep, and he dug a hole in the ground, <laughs> put the pole in, and he put this, this real basketball hoop up for us, and our house. That it had a net. Our, yeah, with net everything, whole nine yards, and then our house became like the, the hub of basketball in the neighborhood. Everybody <laughs> Build came. it and they will come. <laughs> yeah, everybody came to our house to play basketball. And my brother and I were very competitive. About how old were you when, when this was, was happening? This was when I was in uh, seven, from seventh grade through, through 12th Sweet. grade. Yeah, and you know, we were very proud of that basketball court. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we wouldn't let anybody come to our house and beat us on our own home court. Oh, heck That's no. That's how competitive we were. And it was just a hub of the community and you know when I went back to my old neighborhood and I saw the you know the, the basketball goal is long like a gone war zone. many many years ago and I just felt very sad for the kids that are growing up in that neighborhood now because like the condition in the neighborhood now they didn't have anything to do with it they didn't make the good jobs go away they didn't you know make the community deteriorate they didn't disinvest in the community the city leaders disinvested in, in the community they didn't and, leave and the jobs it. the jobs right. left them and absolutely and so when i think about what the condition the neighborhood looks like now i feel very sad for the people who live there because it shouldn't look like that it shouldn't be in that condition it should be better we should and could do better for that neighborhood because people deserve to live in a nice you know comfortable neighborhood. There's no reason people should live on a block that looks like that. It's just very sad to me. And so that's one of the things I advocate for is investment. That in actually um, is, is leading me to, yeah, I, again, we have so many things to ask Reggie and uh, we're already, we're already plotting and scheming to get him to come back. Uh, Maybe we'll have to recreate that six-part series or something like that right here at Hello County. Uh, but um, I remembered hearing, and I, and I do think it was through the Milwaukee Independent and one of the, the shorter YouTube um, videos that's ex uh, you know accessible, and you were discussing about how the economics and um, <clears throat> that and I don't remember exactly like what year, what range, but you know, as far as, you know, for example, white worker to, to black worker, ratio is about the same. Yeah. And you know, that somewhere in recent decades, there's been this grave misnomer that somehow persons of color, you know, are maybe lazy or da 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 da, and it's like, that's just crap. But, right. um, but yeah. that said, how did you had an explanation, you know, for kind of how that came about, and then we're going to launch into some other uh, diversity issues and things like that, and what we can maybe do. Yeah, absolutely. So if you look back at kind of the history of Milwaukee's mm -hmm. black population, the black population in Milwaukee was very small uh, for most of the 20th century. Okay. Um, so, for instance, in 1930, there were only. 7,501 black people in Milwaukee, and that number grew to 8,821 by 1940. And so this is looking at, you know, the early 20th century, the great migration out of the South where black people were leaving the South, getting away from Jim Crow, the degradation of Jim Crow, uh, the violence of Jim Crow, you know, lynchings, anti-black race riots, they were moving away from that. And black people moved to a place like Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, big cities that were manufacturing hubs in large numbers, but they didn't come to Milwaukee because Milwaukee was not a welcoming community. Milwaukee 
most of the, the unions in Milwaukee didn't allow black membership. A lot of the manufacturers would not hire black people. And so Milwaukee wasn't a place that was, you know, attractive to black people who were escaping Jim Crow segregation. Mm -hmm. And so that changed, though, during World War II. There was such a huge need for labor in Milwaukee mm -hmm. during World War II that those factories and the unions opened up to black membership for the first time. And the black population grew very rapidly. So from a little bit less than 9,000 people in 1940, by 1950 was over 21,000 blacks in the city over 62,000 by 1960, and over 105,000 by 1970. And they came because people called them and said, let's get good jobs in Milwaukee, mm -hmm. come to Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. Leave Georgia, leave Arkansas, leave Mississippi, come to Milwaukee. And so they came because they were good jobs. To work. To work, right. They left those places to find good work. And so as a result of black people coming to Milwaukee and getting some of those jobs that were much better than they had in the South, they still, you know, didn't have the best jobs in those manufacturing facilities because there was discrimination in promotions, things of that nature, but they were doing pretty well. So in 1970, blacks in Milwaukee had the seventh highest median family income for blacks of any city in the country. The median family income in 1970 is equivalent to nearly $50,000 in today's money, so black people were doing really, really well in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. And most people in Milwaukee are doing well because of the abundance of manufacturing jobs. Mm -hmm. And the workforce participation rate for white men in Milwaukee was a little over 90% in 1970 and close to 90% for black men. So, you know, people were working because they were available jobs. And so that shifted though, as those jobs started to go away, you started to see some deterioration in job loss in manufacturing in the 1970s, accelerated in the 1980s. There was a huge recession in 1981 through 82, which most people forget about that at the time was the largest recession since the Great Depression. And a lot of manufacturing jobs just disappeared. And never came back. And, and they never came back. And what, what was problematic about that for the black community was that the black people in Milwaukee depended on those jobs at a much higher rate than any other demographic group. So for instance, in 1970 in Milwaukee, 43% of black men and women mm -hmm. worked in blue collar jobs in Milwaukee. And my dad worked at GM, yeah. Janesville plant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And my 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 father-in-law worked at American Motors right here in Milwaukee mm -hmm. on East Capitol. Um, and so, 53% of black men in Milwaukee in 1970 worked in those manufacturing facilities. So these were good, family-supporting you know jobs for people. But as those jobs went away, they were replaced by service sector jobs. And I always like to look at where my father-in-law worked at American Motors on East Capitol. Mm -hmm. You know, he worked there for 35 years and retired at the age of 55. A great job, you know, great well, pay. Well, he was able to retire at 55. Yeah, you know, and, and, and retire with a nice pension, too. But if you go on East Capitol today, where American Motors was, where mm -hmm. the plant was, mm -hmm. you know what's there today? Mm -hmm. Walmart store. And I guarantee you those people at Walmart are not making the kind of money that the people yeah. at American Motors yeah. made years ago. So you replace these family supporting wage jobs with service sector jobs that don't pay nearly as much money and people can't support themselves and their families in the same way. And it leads to, you know, a, a growing rate of poverty. You know, the, the black poverty rate in Milwaukee is the highest of any city in the country. Uh, it's, it's, I believe in 2000, before the pandemic, the black poverty rate in Milwaukee was about 38 percent which is significantly higher than the national poverty rate for blacks it's like 40 percent higher mm. than the poverty rate for blacks nationwide so milwaukee is very challenged by the loss of those jobs and yeah. you know it impacted every community because you know white people worked in those places you know people from the hispanic community blacks mm -hmm. but nobody depended on those jobs in the way that blacks did yeah. and so when the jobs went away it hurt the black community much more than any other community in milwaukee well, I know that even when um, when I was graduating high school in 1979, um, some of my friends uh, there were a lot of General Motors people in Broadhead. <laughs> it was it was 20 some miles away, but you know, uh, uh, mom and dad, mom and dad Rossman uh, got some some farmland from Pete Porterfield and set put down roots and mm -hmm. just a lot of people in the Broadhead area because it was an easy enough commute mm -hmm. 
drive 30, 30, 40 minutes tops. And so a lot of people in my hometown uh, were deeply rooted and steeped in General Motors, which had a, a plant out of Janesville. Mm -hmm. And um, that said, I had... I was actually like the first in my nuclear family. Now there were other family members that had gone to college, became, became educators off times and whatever, but you know, dad was blue collar, uh, worked on the line forever eventually, forklift driver. So it was within my purvey to consider applying at GM because at that point in 79 still, you know, it was a path to a good living. Mm -hmm. And and in '79 it was you know a little more common for women to to be on the line or whatever. Um, Helen Reddy, I'm woman, hear me roar. But uh, so I had considered it for a time. I ended up my cousin, you know, who had gone to university, became an educator. It's like oh, you want to go to college, you want to go. It's like okay. So I I got swayed that way, and I'm glad that I did because yeah. I couldn't have foreseen that plant closing right you know those, those were places that families worked in right families if, if your mom or dad worked there they could get you a job there there's a, the, a friend of mine that i used to work with when i was a teacher and you know his dad worked at a.o smith for years mm -hmm. had a good job at a.o smith as a welder a family supporting job yeah, a great job as a welder at a.o smith and so oh, a you welder? know he told his son, you know, when you graduate high school, you can come and get a job on the line at A.O. Smith, mm -hmm. work, work with me. Yeah. And his son really didn't want to do it. He wanted to go to college. And he basically told his son, he said, why would you do something stupid like that when I can get you a job tomorrow working on the line with me at A.O. Smith? Making good money. Right. And so that's what a lot of families did is they depended on those jobs generationally. And I say to people all the time that, you know, when, when you have, you know, that that kind of consistent within your family where you know your grandfather worked mm -hmm. you know at that place and your dad you know other family members friends neighbors then there's a, a that's kind of inducement for you to follow in their footsteps and do the same thing and so what it creates in the minds of some people is this idea of like why should i go to you know college and spend a bunch of money on college when i can have a guaranteed job yep. here in a you know a factory making good money good benefits good benefits all of those things that come with those good jobs mm -hmm. why would i go and so it ends up creating a a, a lack of uh desire for people to want to go off to college now many of these people who worked in manufacturing facilities they they knew that they had enough disposable income that they could send their kids off to college mm -hmm. and you know that was a goal for a lot of people you know mm -hmm. make good money buy a nice house have a nice car you know, take care of my children, you know, take them on vacations, send them off to college mm -hmm. because they had the money to do it. They had the disposable income to do that. And people were able to, you know, make investments because they had disposable income mm -hmm. and, you know, invest in stocks and bonds and things of that mm -hmm. nature and have a nice nest egg to help their children, you know, buy their first home here. Mm -hmm. I'll give you the money for the down payment on their first house. And so those are you know, some of the benefits of having those really high quality jobs. But Milwaukee, you know, it's one of these Rust Belt cities that these jobs were abundant, you know, all throughout, you know, the Midwest and the East Coast, you know, Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. Cleveland, Detroit, you know, Cincinnati, so many places. And, you know, there are a lot of places like that throughout the state of Wisconsin, up north, you know, in the, with paper, paper, you know, paper manufacturers, mills. the paper mm -hmm. mills are. When those jobs went away, mm -hmm. those communities were devastated. So the same way Milwaukee, Central sure. City, was devastated by the loss of these good jobs, the same thing happened in, in small towns around Wisconsin, including places like Janesville, when those big factories went out of business. Everything changed. The people didn't change, you know, but the yeah, neighborhoods changed. The people didn't changed. leave the jobs. The right. jobs left the people. Yeah, and so you're left to pick up the pieces of a devastated community. It reminds me of my hometown in Mississippi. There was a big factory in town back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. and, you know, a lot of people worked there. And that factory closed, and there was no other real real work in town. So people started to, you know, drive 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 miles away to find jobs because, mm -hmm. you know, that was the only really decent job in town. So when these manufacturing jobs disappear from any community, it doesn't matter what the community looks like, 
it's not going to look the same afterwards. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to see a growth in poverty, and along with the growth in poverty, you're going to see an increase in, you know, alcoholism among people, drug abuse. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to see crime increase in those communities. It happens in every, doesn't matter who the people are, this happens in every community sure. when good jobs go away. Sure. And so oftentimes people look at Milwaukee and they blame the conditions of the city on the residents. It's like they didn't have anything to do with the jobs going away. They didn't want PAPS to go out of business right. or Schlitz or American Motors. You know, I looked at the top employers in Milwaukee in 1970 and made a list of how many people they employed. Mm -hmm. And looked at, you know, where are those companies now? And of the top 12 companies, in, the top 12 employers in Milwaukee in 1970, all of them are gone except a couple. So, you know, perhaps and, and by gone, gone listen, not just from they're out of business. Yeah, they, they've but disappeared. They don't when exist anymore. Stuff started being shipped overseas. Or even, not necessarily overseas, <laughs> oftentimes, you know, they, they, they moved out to suburban communities first and then mm. they left and they went maybe to, you know, Mexico or they went, you know, mm -hmm. across the ocean, some other country. But many of these companies went out of business, don't exist right. anymore, or they downsized tremendously. Like, uh, A.O. Smith, before they left the city, they downsized. Mm -hmm. Then they were bought out by Tower Automotive. Now, A.O. Smith, for people who don't know A.O. Smith, mm -hmm. through the 1970s, A.O. Smith had provided the car and truck frames for every American car company. They built the car and truck frames in Milwaukee. And so I remember as a kid, you know, friends of mine, mm -hmm. parents worked at A.O. Smith and would go by A.O. Smith and see all of these car frame stacked up, you know, 30 right. feet high. Right. And mountains of them. Yeah, mountains <laughs> of them. And so they downsized initially, then they were bought out by Tower Automotive in 1996, I think. And by 2007, they were gone. In 1970, they employed about 11,000 people in Milwaukee. And many of the people that lived in the neighborhood around A.O. Smith, you know, were people who worked at A.O. Smith. They were able to work there and buy a home, and they're like, I can buy a house right, you know, right there, up the street. Right? I mean, these these family supporting jobs they go away, and so not only did your income go with it, but you do own your home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so now you've actually got roots, so less likely to. Maybe you're a young man and you were just working there and, and it goes away and you can go easily go somewhere else and chase after something else. But that was part of part of it too, right? I mean, people yeah. were stranded, basically. Yeah, stranded because, uh, you know, the, the jobs, the good jobs went away and they were left to fend for themselves without, you know, availability of the types of jobs that their parents or grandparents had gotten accustomed to. And so now what do you do? You're stuck, you know, you have to feed yourself provide for yourself and maybe job. your family and you know it doesn't support anything those types of jobs <laughs> and and it's very difficult so you know some people make the decision to do something to make money in a different way and mm -hmm. it may be illegal and people may frown on people that do you know illegal things to make money but yeah, people feed. have to feed themselves and their families they're going to do whatever they need to do mm -hmm. and if that's the only thing that's available that's the stream of income that's available then many people, but well not many, but some people are going to always make that choice, right? right? That's just the way life is. And so what ends up happening is when those jobs start to disappear in the early 1980s in Milwaukee, shortly after that you begin to see the poverty rate just drastically increase and you start to see crack cocaine come into the black community in Milwaukee mm -hmm. and just devastate the community. You know, a lot of people who, so many you know, who used, to, used to work at these manufacturing facilities, they're out of work, they're depressed, and so this helps to kind of soothe them in some way, you know, using drugs. Mm -hmm. And of course, the more people that use drugs, the more people sell drugs. And so you start seeing this crisis of, of uh, crime in Milwaukee because people are competing over drug territory, mm -hmm. and it really just devastates Milwaukee. And fortunately for me, I had graduated from high school and went into the Navy, so I missed all of this now, ugly obviously stuff. obviously owned the home in the neighborhood that you were describing to us that you went and took a peek at in 2018. She must have sold at some point in love. She actually rented from a friend of hers, a good she friend rented. of hers. Okay, okay. It was a good friend of hers who owned a bunch of rental properties and gave her a really good deal on the rent. Okay, okay. So we were never homeowners at that time. Okay, so, my you, mother, so you weren't stranded per se. No. Okay. No. My mother... And after my brother and I graduated from high school and moved away, 
Mm -hmm. uh, my mother eventually bought a, bought a home, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in a different neighborhood, uh, and she's still a homeowner to this day. Got it. You know, she, she's been a homeowner for a number of years, but at that time, you know, she got a really good deal from from a friend who owned you know some rental right, properties right. and took meticulous care of these properties. I mean, mm -hmm. our house was a beautiful house, you know. Uh, the inside of the house, I love those old houses in mm -hmm. Milwaukee that mm -hmm. had, you know, wood wood everywhere in the houses. Just just so great, gorgeous. you know, leaded glass. It was just mm -hmm. a beautiful house. Mm -hmm. And, you know, from the outside, you wouldn't know how beautiful it was on the inside. Mm -hmm. But, man, we were very proud of that. that oh. It wasn't ours, but it was, you know, it was ours. But again, the, the, the level of, and, and we had touched on it briefly, either on or off camera, that, you know... <laughs> that renter isn't necessarily a death sentence to right. a, a neighborhood because as you described, there are plenty of uh, examples where where it, it didn't affect the pride factor and, and the taking care of your home and the yard and, and, and everything else. But really, we, we started to go down the road and I think we'll probably table this for another time and really deep dive into the economics and, 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 and that, but I do want to, I, I can't have you right next to me and not pay homage to James Cameron. Yeah. And, and of course the Black Holocaust Museum. If you could lay some knowledge on us about the museum, about his legacy, yeah. and so on. Yeah, so Dr. James Cameron was the founder of America's Black Holocaust Museum. I was Museum. Doctor. I'm so sorry. I didn't, yeah. I didn't say that. And so Dr. Cameron became my mentor and very close friend. Uh, I got to know him really, really well the last six years of his life. He died in 2006 at the age of 92. But what he's most well known for is being a survivor of a lynching. He survived a brutal lynching in Marion, Indiana on August 7, 1930. His two friends, Abe Smith and Thomas Shipp, were murdered and he was taken out of the jail and beaten unmercifully and nearly killed, but he, he escaped, miraculously escaped, and he wanted people to know about that, so he actually wrote a book about the lynching, uh, his memoir, um, and it's in a third edition now. It's called The Time of Terror, A Survivor Story. It's a beautifully written book, uh, the third edition, and I tell people if you get the, the book, by the third edition, and I say that because, first of all, it's the best version because you know, we added some material that wasn't in the first or second edition in the book, and I wrote the afterword for the third edition to the book. It's a beautiful book. Uh, talks about his early life, what led up to the lynching that, that hot August day in Marion, Indiana, how he survived, and, you know, that whole thing, and so... He became Indiana involved. Still has some shenanigans At the time, in the 1930s, Indiana had more Ku Klux Klan members than any state in the United States. It was a haven for the Ku Klux Klan. And so, you know, he ended up becoming involved in civil rights in mm -hmm. the state of Indiana. He was appointed director of civil liberties for the state by the governor of Indiana. Uh, and he opened three chapters of the NAACP in Indiana, which was unheard of at that time. I mean, people literally threatened his life. And in 1952, he and his wife, Virginia, uh, fled the state of Indiana because of death threats. Mm -hmm. They wanted to protect their children. And so they were going to move to Canada. They had given up on the U.S. They said, we're going to move to Canada. But he was born in Wisconsin. He was born in La Crosse, Wisconsin, 1914. So he came back to his home state. And we don't know exactly why he came to Milwaukee, but he stopped in Milwaukee. And he fell in love with Milwaukee. You know, he had a thriving black uh -huh. business, 1952, yeah. thriving uh -huh. black business community yeah. in Milwaukee on Walnut right. Street. And so he fell in love with the city of Milwaukee. He decided to move his family to Milwaukee. And he, he worked in a variety of different occupations. You know, he uh -huh. was an entrepreneur. He opened up businesses. Uh, he worked at Mayfair Mall as a, as a technician for the HVAC wow. at Mayfair Mall for a number of years. And he's about devout Catholic and him and his wife would travel with their you know with their church uh -huh. on different trips they love to travel they went you know so many different countries but one of the most important trips they ever took was in 1979 they went on a holy pilgrimage with their church to to the Holy Land and when they were in Jerusalem they visited a place called Yad Vashem 
which for people who don't know, Yad Vashem is a Jewish Holocaust memorial there in Jerusalem. And at the time, you know, that they visited, he and Virginia were walking around seeing these horrible things that happened during the Holocaust. And the last part of the visit of Yad Vashem at that time was a, uh, what they call the Garden of the Righteous Gentiles. And this was a garden dedicated to the memory of non-Jews that helped Jews escape, Jewish individuals and families escape the Holocaust. And so there are all of these people's names in this garden. And he and Virginia in this garden, you know, reading these stories of these wonderful people who helped, you know, Jewish families and individuals escape the Holocaust. And they're both in tears because it's so sad, you know, everything that they witnessed at Yad Vashem. And so he says, he told his wife, he said, Virginia, you know what? We need a museum like this in America to tell the story of black people and what happened to them and all of those freedom-loving white people that helped us along our journey. And so that planted the seed in his mind to open a museum and, and name it in honor of, of you know, that visit to Yad Vashem. So he came back and he worked for a number of years on trying to open a museum that he, he called America's Black Holocaust Museum, which opened in 1988. And he found a permanent home for the museum in 1992. He found a building on the corner of 4th and North Avenue in Milwaukee. He bought the building from the city of Milwaukee. And that became a permanent home mm -hmm. of the museum. And it stayed open for 20, well, it stayed open until 2008. So Dr. Cameron died at the age of 92 in 2006, June 11, 2006, he died. I became a volunteer with the museum in 2002 and became a member of the Board of Directors in 2005. Mm -hmm. I became the board president in 2007. Uh, and, you know, once Dr. Cameron passed, I became the public face of the museum and, you know, kind of carried on his legacy. His work uh, became one of the griots at the museum. Griot is a term we use to describe the, the docents at the museum, to give tours to the visitors to honor, you know, the historical tradition in West Africa of griots who were the oral historians, the keepers of the history of their communities. And so I became the head griot at the museum, training the other griots on that history. And it became a really important part of my life. And um, you know, after the museum closed, you know, we were devastated because we ran out of money, literally. But we wanted to keep Dr. Cameron's memory and vision and mission alive, but we didn't have any money. So we started to do, you know, work in the community, doing programs in the community, talking about the things that the museum talked about. Mm -hmm. And that led to people realizing that, you know, the museum is gone, but it's not really gone because these people that are dedicated to Dr. Cameron's memory are still here. You know, they're a treasure for us to utilize. And so eventually that led to people offering money to reopen the museum, to build a new, a new building. And so a real estate developer uh, was building a development on the site of where the building was. They tore down the old Black Holocaust Museum and they built on the footprint of it. They built this real estate development right next to Garfield Elementary School. Uh, this development with you know low-income housing, uh, and they built commercial space on the first floor of that building for the new home for America's Black Holocaust Museum. So, in 2021, on Dr. Cameron's birthday, February 25th of 2021, we had the grand opening of the museum, and it's you know it was. For, for those of us who cared about Dr. Cameron and loved Dr. Cameron and understood how important he was and his legacy was, it was like a, just a wonderful moment in our lives to see that, you know, after all these years with the museum being shuttered, you know, it's back in the community. It's a resource for the community again, excuse me, Deb. And it's a really important resource, uh, you know. And so in the meantime, before we had money, though, uh, Dr. Fran Kaplan, who was, you know, one of the members of this group, Mm -hmm. She came up with this brilliant idea. She said, listen, we don't have any money. We can't build a museum, but we can build a virtual museum. Let's build a museum online. So she created America's by Holocaust Museum Virtual Museum, which is kind of like the website for the museum, but it's not really a website. It's a museum. It's over 3,000 pages of exhibit material on a variety of topics that, you know, you can go and visit in your pajamas. And... Uh, Oh, who doesn't been, love that? Yeah, it's been active since <laughs> back in 2012. I'm used to it during the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, so the virtual museum has been active since 2012. Mm -hmm. The new physical museum reopened in 2021. And so it's, it's you know, it's, it's a resource for people. Mm -hmm. You know, Dr. Cameron wanted the museum to be a place where people could learn some of those hidden parts of American history. 
that we don't typically teach in our schools because he said this is an important part of the American story. It's ugly. You have to understand history or you're bound to repeat the mistake. Yeah, he says, you know, these things may be ugly, but, you know, not everything about America was great. There were some wonderful things. Founding Fathers, you know, created a wonderful, you know, a wonderful new republic. They did pretty good on the framework. Yeah, they, they, did, they did something wonderful, but they didn't fulfill their own mission of making a place that was a land of freedom, justice, and liberty for everybody. Because at the time that they drew up the Constitution, there were close to 700,000 black people enslaved in the United States of America. And so that slavery continued through 1860s, formally under the law, to 1865. Mm -hmm. And so Dr. Cameron wanted people to understand that history mm -hmm. of how African people were enslaved. You know, when, when the Civil War ended in 1865, there were still almost 4 million black people living in, in bondage in this country. Mm -hmm. So he wanted people to know that story, mm -hmm. uh, the story of how we got here. You know, the journey across the Atlantic Ocean and those slaving ships, you know, the history of the transatlantic slave trade, and then what happened after slavery ended and how, you know, Reconstruction uh, ended in a very short period of time, 12 years later, and the degradation that blacks were living with under slavery kind of continued under, you know, these new laws called black codes in the South. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, even though constitutional amendments, you know, ended slavery, uh, gave black people citizenship rights for the first time ever, mm -hmm. and gave black men the right to vote. It wasn't long before those rights were just, you know, just ignored. And by 1900, most black men had been disenfranchised and could no longer vote in the country. Mm -hmm. You know, I tell people all the time, Deb, you know, when you think about the civil rights movement, you know, one of the, the goals of the civil rights movement, one thing Dr. King and, and people that working with him were pushing for was, you know, the right for black people to vote. That had been guaranteed by the 15th Amendment to the Constitution. Yep. But they had lost that, and people don't know how they lost it or why they lost it. Dr. Cameron wanted people to understand, you know, what happened. And so the museum today, you know, tells the story of that journey of black people in, in America mm -hmm. from the time that they were living, you know, wonderful lives back in Africa, mm -hmm. what happened to those some societies they lived in, how slavery, you know, became the norm with people, you know, bringing ships from Europe and the United States to Africa, you know, kidnapping people, purchasing people from people, and, you know, Trafficking somewhere really. between 12 and 12 and 15 million Africans were displaced from Africa mm -hmm. over a period of 300 and some odd years. And so, you know, that's a part of our story. That's a part of American history. We, 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 we can try to run from it, but we can't hide from it because the records are still there. You know, we know that many, many early U.S. presidents were slave owners, including Thomas Jefferson and George Washington were both slave owners, right? And uh, so that's a part of our history. You know, we can talk about the founding fathers and how wonderful they were, but they were not perfect men. Oh, heck no. Well, and I think it's... I I like to think it is commonly known <laughs> that, uh, uh, you know, uh, Declaration of Independence, it was intended for white landowners, you know, as a woman, I was also chattel, so, well, I, not me personally, but, um, you know what I mean. Uh, yeah. Dawn has uh, left us a comment, she goes, when the newspapers merged, I took a buyout. Because she, she's, uh, she's, she'll probably even say, but as far as like the Milwaukee Journal, the Milwaukee Sentinel, when they, when they merged, she took a buyout. She goes, I saw computers were becoming a thing. Yeah, yeah. That kind of stuck. That stuck. Who knew? Who knew? Yeah. Uh, a big thing. And uh, she said, I took multiple classes on computers, Microsoft Office products that helped me find another job, best investment at that time. So that's an awesome comment. Um, I'm not sure if she had a question in there. It doesn't sound like it. I think she's uh, maybe hinting toward when the manufacturing jobs left and people were in fact stranded. Mm -hmm. But uh, that, that's going to, uh, I think we'll probably want to tackle that another day when we talk general economics and things like that and you know when that shift happened and people getting stuck and 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 not having attended had the opportunity to attend university or whatever mm -hmm. and, um, and 
and now there's you know another big thing even now with uh, we're we're shifting again. It's like the the university, the four year degree, and even mm -hmm. the masters and the doctorates, you know, don't hold the same sway that they did. We need tradespeople and so on and so forth. But that that's a whole other whole other uh, can of worms when it comes right down to it. Because I also want us to segue into uh, you letting us know more about your book that you're working on. Now, how, how far along are you on the I'm book? in the very early stages. Early stages, okay. Uh, I'm actually uh, going to be doing some interviews for the book this month, uh, for the first chapter of the book. So the book is about the history of segregation in Milwaukee. And I've been uh, engaging in conversations and presentations and written articles about the history of segregation in Milwaukee mm -hmm. going back to 2015. And so I've become kind of the, the segregation expert in Milwaukee. And I've been investing a lot of time and effort in, you know, raising awareness about the history of segregation in Milwaukee. And so I decided, you know, why don't I write a book about it? Put all of this stuff that's in my head in, in a book so people can understand the history of it because there's so much, so many misconceptions about segregation. And I want to correct the, you know, the narrative about it. What is so the biggest misconception? The biggest misconception is that people self-segregated, that people wanted to live around people like themselves, and they created segregated communities. And that's absolutely not true. There were bigger forces at play that helped create segregation. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, I want to tell that story and tell all the layers of that story because it's it's not just about you know segregation it's about what segregation caused in terms of you know in Milwaukee for you know people who were who were kept out of our suburbs kept out of you know opportunities to go to better performing schools mm -hmm. kept away from access to better quality jobs you know as the jobs in Milwaukee left many manufacturers initially left Milwaukee and moved to the suburbs. So people that were kept out of the suburbs very intentionally. Mm -hmm. Variety of tools right, that kept them what out. happened after that, right? The, yeah. the the manufacturing jobs have moved out. This is in the eighties, nineties, things like mm -hmm. that, which is already thirty plus years ago. And you were talking in one of your in one of, maybe through Milwaukee Independent or something, with it with it now being this generational issue as well, but back to back to your letting us know yeah, yeah, the misconceptions so, of segregation. Yeah, so so what I want to do is I want to tell the, the story of how segregation developed in Milwaukee, who was responsible for it very specifically, who was responsible, and the impact of it, and how it helped lead to this huge gap in home ownership rates between blacks and whites mm -hmm. in Metro Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. We have one of the largest gaps in the difference between black and white home ownership of any city in the country. I think we I mean, have. Nationally. Yeah, nationally. I think Milwaukee has one of the, the largest gaps of any city. And we have and the current. second lowest, yeah, we have the second lowest black home ownership rate of any of the 50 largest cities in the country. Only 27% of blacks in Milwaukee own their homes. Nationally, about what? 40. 27%? Nationally, about 44% of blacks are homeowners, but in Milwaukee, it's 27%. The only city worse than us of the top 50 cities is Minneapolis at 25%. And so, how did that happen? You know, people ask me all the time, well, what happened? How did that happen? And, you know, the story of. So, the book is about the history of segregation, but the book is also about how Milwaukee got to be what it is today with all of the challenges that the city has, because all these things are, to me, you know, part of the same story. And this is kind of how I, I explain to people, Deb, you know, for people out there who may do, you know, jigsaw puzzles, you know, you get this big thousand piece puzzle, right? You dump all of the pieces on a big table, and then you look at the cover and you start putting the puzzle together, right? Imagine, Deb, if somebody came in and grabbed the cover of that jigsaw puzzle box from you, how much harder would it be for you to do the puzzle, right? Well, that would be very challenging, right. actually. I mean, I could maybe do the flat border edges and then I'd be lost. Right. <laughs> Especially and depending on the puzzle, I'd be lost. Yeah, and that, that to me is the essence of, of people not understanding the Milwaukee of today and why it looks the way it looks because somebody took the cover away. Um. And I'm trying to repaint that cover for people with this book to let people know this summer Milwaukee became what it is and these are the forces that play 
and segregation policies and practices played a huge role in it. You know, we're, we're sitting in Tulsa right now. Uh, there was a tool of segregation called racial restrictive covenants, which was an attachment to the deed, you know, for properties and mostly in subdivisions that dictated that only white people could live in these these subdivisions, right? And they were very oh, explicit. I've heard of Whitefish Bay, I've never been. Yeah, yeah. You know the nickname for Whitefish Bay, White Folks Bay, right? And so <laughs> these racial restricted covenants were used as a tool to create all white communities, and they were legally binding and enforceable. Uh, from the early 1900s until 1948, the Supreme Court ruled in a case called Shelley v. Kramer that these can no longer be legally enforced. So prior to 1948, if you own a home in one of these subdivisions, let's just say Washington Highlands subdivision in Walla Tulsa, right, which is one of the earliest covenants written in Tulsa, you own that home and Reggie came along and you sold a home to Reggie, you could, you could lose the property for doing that. Your neighbors would sue you because the racial covenant said that only white people could live in that subdivision and you decide to sell it to me, well, what happens? Your neighbor would sue you and you would lose that property. They wouldn't allow me to move in and you would lose everything you lose, the property, all the equity you built in And this in was it. enforced through 1948. 1948. And so what the Supreme Court ruled in Shelley v. Kramer is that, uh, you know, you can no longer enforce these covenants. So you can't, you know, evict people from these properties. You can't make them lose their properties, but you can still write these covenants. And so they were still constitutional according to the Supreme Court because they were binding agreements between private parties. But in 1968, the Federal Fair Housing Act finally ruled that no, this is a violation of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, which guaranteed people, you know, home ownership rights. And so it became unconstitutional in 1968 which, you know, isn't all that long in ago. In 68. 1968. Okay. But by the time yeah, they became slowly, it? illegal, they had done so much damage that, you know, the damage is like, it's unbelievable. So I'm working with a group at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee that's working to map all of the racial covenants in Milwaukee County. It's called Mapping Racism and Resistance. So looking at where the covenants were written throughout Milwaukee County, mm -hmm. but also looking at the resistance to these covenants. Now people fought back against them, and there was a lot of people fighting back against them. And the way that the program is designed I mean, to, to find that the covenants. In, in areas that still, while it may not be officially enforceable, it's still predominantly the way. Oh, this is what happened, Deb. And so, you know, they're looking at these covenants, and they, they've mapped about half of them so far. They've mapped. <laughs> So far, 12,000 covenants in Milwaukee County. And they How think many? there's 12,000 of these covenants so far they've mapped. They expect to be done early next year with the rest. And they, they think they're going to find somewhere between 20 and 25,000 altogether in Milwaukee County, these racial covenants. They were all over the county uh, in all 18 of the suburbs throughout the city of Milwaukee. In fact, the neighborhood that I live in in Milwaukee, racial covenants were, were written just north of the block that my wife and I live on. So back in the day, you know, some of the people that I know that live up the street a few blocks away wouldn't mm -hmm. be able to live there because they're black. You know, and these places were restricted to whites only. And, um, and this has nothing to do with your income, your, yeah, it didn't you know, make whatever. A it's like, it's this, yeah. uh, okay, Dawn chimed in, she goes, oh no, that was, that was, that was, a, that was a previous comment. Okay. Um, yeah. When did you buy? We bought our house in 2003. 2003. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was mm -hmm. only just not long before that 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 covenant was well, in place or still in place? Well, I'm, I'm interested to look at the covenants that are close to where we live now. Uh -huh. Once they're done with the project, I'll be able to take a look and see where those covenants that were close to our neighborhood were and see the date. So the way the covenants work, Deb, is that you know, they started writing these covenants in the early 1900s, you know, 1917, 1927, 1937, but they extended out many, many years. So there was one covenant written in South Milwaukee, written in 1937, that said only Caucasian people can live in this subdivision, and it was set to expire okay. January 1st, 2024. So had the Fair Housing Act never been passed in 1968, Wait, it's that, expire covenant, in that covenant, that covenant, that covenant, that covenant, that covenant 
if it wasn't ruled as unconstitutional with the Fair Housing Act 1968, that covenant would still be in effect to this day. And that subdivision would, would be, you know, all white and nobody who isn't white would be legally allowed to occupy that, that any properties there until January 1st of 2024. You realize you're completely blowing my mind. You know, these I mean, are things and that... And I thought I was relatively hip and savvy about some things, but... These are things that, that no. very few people are aware of, the, you know, these covenants and how they worked. And, and the thing that blows me away is how casually people wrote these covenants and the language that they used. They didn't try to cover what they were doing. They were very explicit in creating, you know, Expressly communities... Expressly, too. For white Shut people out. only. And I mean, they, they literally said, you Any know, this... Non. This... No properties here could be owned, leased, rented, or occupied, and that was the key word, occupied, by persons other than of the white race or you know, of the Caucasian race. They, they said things exactly like that in these covenants. They were very explicit, and um, these things were written all over, you know, the country in many, many communities. In fact, many of them were written years before any black people moved anywhere near those places. Now, you also had other groups that were impacted by the covenants, uh, depending on where they were written at. You know, uh, we, I know in Minneapolis, there were covenants written to keep Asian people out of the communities there in Minneapolis. Uh, in many communities around the country, they were written to prevent Jewish families from moving into those communities as well. Uh, you know, uh, these people that were considered to be inharmonious racial and ethnic groups were literally you know, kept out of opportunities to move to wherever they wanted to move, which was guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. You should be able to live anywhere you can afford to live. But they made exceptions in many of these covenants. They said, you know, this covenant doesn't cover, you know, a domestic worker that works for the family. They can occupy the space during their work hours, but after their work day is over, they couldn't legally occupy oh, that sure. space. Come in and work. Yeah. <laughs> and so the, you know, that was one of the tools of creating segregation in widespread around Milwaukee County. Well, um, it's relatively <clears throat> well known that Harlem was created. <laughs> um, and, and to this day, uh, there's no fee. Um, it doesn't cost you anything to go from Midtown to Harlem. Mm -hmm. If you're going beyond Harlem, you know, your ticket price has, you know, for however much further, right? Mm -hmm. Because all the Riverside mansions and whatnot and whatnot and the staff, you know, had to, to this day, you know, there's no, I could ride back and forth from Harlem to Midtown all as much as I wanted to <laughs> and yeah. at, at no cost. Past that, I'd need a ticket. Yeah. Um, and so, funny, kind of some of the yeah, and things that are still, it's like, because for the longest time I was like, I wonder why that is. I wonder why that is. And yeah. I said, well, it goes back to this. And it's like, huh. Yeah, there's a lot of ugly history related to this. And, you know, <laughs> uh, the covenants were originally pushed by the National Association of Realtors. They helped to create covenants because in 1917, Supreme Court ruled that racial zoning laws, which were, you know, used throughout, you know, cities to create, you know, Oh, this is a black neighborhood, this is a white neighborhood. And like what whatever. time frame was that? The early 1900s. So in 1917, those racial zoning laws became illegal and unconstitutional. So people turned to using racial covenants because the Supreme Court ruled in 1926 in a case now that the that covenants... how is covenant can do what they do when it's outlawed and... Do yeah. you get my question? Yes, yeah, so the racial zoning laws were ruled unconstitutional as a violation of the 14th Amendment. The Supreme Court in 1926 ruled that listen, this is a, an agreement between private parties, so it's perfectly well, legal. caveat. Yep, that's what the Supreme Court ruled. That's why Whitefish Bay is yep. White Folks Bay. Yep, yep, and so what these is covenants help to do <laughs> uh, is very white in Whitefish Bay. You know, I looked at the demographics of Milwaukee metropolitan area. Mm -hmm. uh, so the city of Milwaukee is a very diverse place, the most diverse city in the state of Wisconsin. So. 32% of residents are non-Hispanic whites, 38% are black, 20% are Hispanics, about 4% Asian American, mm -hmm. and a little bit less than one half, 1% Native American. So it's a very diverse city. But when you leave the city of Milwaukee, look at the 18 suburbs that wrap around Milwaukee, 75% of the residents are white. And then when you go out to the exurban counties, Waukesha, Milwaukee, Washington counties, 
they're all 89 to 91% white. I think Waukesha is 89%, uh, Ozaukee County is 90% white, and Washington County is 91% white. So you see a very diverse city surrounded by communities that aren't diverse at all. And that's because these places use covenants to keep black people out, and very intentionally for decades. I mean, literally. Literally, literally. for decades. And so what it also did was it, it created these homogeneous white communities that were stable communities. And because they were stable communities with a bunch of homeowners, people who got loans from the Federal Housing Administration, who pushed the use of racial covenants and said they would not insure any you know, areas uh, unless they had racial covenants in place. Federal Housing Administration literally wrote that in their underwriting manual that you could not get us to insure these properties through the FHA loans unless they had racial covenants in place. So the Federal Housing Administration followed in the footsteps of you know, the National Association of Realtors and pushing covenants, and they spread like wildfire across the country. And so you know, these were big entities that created segregation. Oh, yeah, these are massive yeah. institutions that are yeah. perpetuating. Mm -hmm. Not just perpetuating, but creating segregation. In, in 1900, America was not a, a residentially segregated country. It was very mixed neighborhoods were the norm throughout America. Uh, but by 1928, 50% of all homes in America had a racial covenant attached to them, 50%. And so you created you know, all white neighborhoods. So this mm -hmm. is why I say, you know, when people say, you know, people self-segregated, literally the only people that self-segregated were white people. They had institutional power to create you know, all white communities, and they did it, you know, willy-nilly around the country, you know, for year after year after year, and, and kept those, you know, communities where they lived in as homogeneous communities, and the property values increased dramatically in those communities, and so, you know, people were able to live a good existence and build equity and generational wealth in their families, and, and that's part of the reason that many places in Metro Milwaukee look so much better than the city of Milwaukee looks. That, that did remind me that when you were talking about let's let's just pluck the 60s because I'm a child of the 60s and 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 at that point in in Milwaukee you've got all the the swell manufacturing jobs you've got you know people living cheek to jowl as it were you know coexisting because these jobs are paying family supporting wages mm -hmm. and everything else and and I was curious about racial tension mm -hmm. or lack thereof if, well, if everyone's if everyone's you know getting paid well taking care of their families everyone's fed you know, you see, even even in species, right? You know, you, you can have the, the lion and the and the sheep. You know, they're fed. <laughs> yeah. Normally, it'd be a bad situation to have them, you know, in close proximity. But uh, um, the, I guess the question is, to your knowledge, and I suspect you know, what was? I mean, we know that there were racial tensions, but specifically in Milwaukee. What did it look like in the 60s as opposed to now in 2012? Well, the big difference is that in the 1960s, the black population in Milwaukee was still pretty small, but it was growing really, really fast. You know, uh, and as the black population grew faster and blacks moved out of the, the neighborhood that they were forced to live in, right. that was red line neighborhood, and they were able to move into different neighborhoods as those racial covenants expired and they were able to move to new neighborhoods. They encroached on neighborhoods that, that had previously been all white neighborhoods. Okay. And so you start to see tensions between people. And you also had at the same time a very segregated school system. Milwaukee Public Schools was very, very segregated, intensely segregated in the 1960s. So as the black population was increasing very rapidly, all of these black children who were going to be you know, MPS students, you know, the schools on the north side of Milwaukee, which is the neighborhood where black people were forced to live, the schools became very overcrowded, and the school district decided to build new schools, but not on the north side. They built new schools on the south side, where the student population was, was, was falling because white people were leaving the city mm. and fleeing out to the newly built suburbs, you know, that started being built in the early 1950s. 
So white people live in the city of Milwaukee, going out to the suburbs, taking their children with them. And so the school district was very, very uh, segregated. And the, the district came up with this policy they called intact busing. And this is going to blow you away, Deb. So the way intact busing worked was that instead of building schools where there was a need, mm -hmm. where the student population was increasing, they built them in the other neighborhoods right. that didn't need new schools. Right. And what they did is now the black schools are overcrowded. They, they have to get an education. So they started putting black children and their teachers and their black teachers on a bus and busing them to schools on the south side. But they kept them completely separate from their white peers. I'm they sorry. had no classes together. They didn't have in recess the 60s together. When I was a child. Yep, no classes I'm together. I'm on this planet, and that's nope. happening here yep. in Milwaukee. Yep. Intact busing, uh, uh, official policy of Milwaukee Public School District, and so they kept them separate. No, no classes together. No lunch. No recess. Nothing. They had no contact with each oh, other. Oh come on. And some, and some schools, they they literally put trailers on the playground, and that was the classroom for the black students and their teachers. So this was official policy in Milwaukee Public Schools, created a lot of tension. Uh, citizens in the black community. You have to write your book. Yeah. Citizens in Milwaukee started to, you know, notice this and complain about it and try to force the school district to do something, but they wouldn't change the policy. They wouldn't fix it. They wouldn't build new schools on the north side. Instead, they would build like an extension onto the school. And so uh, there was a boycott of the schools in 1964 led by a group called Music. Uh, and so the following year, 1965, the year I was born, mm -hmm. attorney Lloyd Barbie filed a lawsuit against Milwaukee Public Schools because the schools were illegally segregated. And that case went through the court system in 1976. Federal Judge John Reynolds ruled that yes, Milwaukee schools are illegally segregated, a violation of the Brown vs. Board of Education decision. And he ordered them to fix, fix the problem to integrate the schools. It was in 1976? 1976, when the schools were first ordered to be integrated. So I want to tell you another thing about my story. So when I lived in Mississippi, my family moved to Milwaukee in 1973. So my last grade in Mississippi was second grade. Right? And the state of Mississippi had basically given the, the, the middle finger to the Supreme Court over the Brown versus Board of Education decision. They said, we're not going to integrate our schools. And it wasn't until I think 1970, where a federal judge finally forced Mississippi to integrate their schools. So when I went to school as a little boy in Mississippi, mm. in second grade, I had black and white classmates. Moved to Milwaukee from third grade through eighth grade. Every school I attended in Milwaukee was all black dip. I didn't have white classmates until I went to high school. It was better in Mississippi. It was better in Mississippi. I didn't realize. I mean, I just figured, you know, it is what it is. First time I had white classmates. What was the illusion I had about being in the northern state of Wisconsin? Yeah, my nickname for Wisconsin. Off I call abolitionist in 1848. Yeah, yeah I, I call Wisconsin Mississippi because it's it's not that different from Mississippi in my opinion. But mm -hmm. the first time I had white classmates in school in Milwaukee was because I decided to go to Milwaukee Tech High School on the south side. I caught the city bus every morning. Right and rode the city bus all the way to the south side from the north side, and I had white classmates. But this is the thing, white classmates, white friends, but I never saw them outside of school, Deb, because at the end of the day, I went back to the north side, and they went, you know, to wherever they lived on the south side. So I didn't have any, I had friends, but I wouldn't call them close friends who were sure. white, sure. because I had no contact after school with them, unless it was, you know, after school activities of some type. And, I tell people, like, you know, I left Jim Crow to South and moved to Jim Crow to North, literally. You sure did. And, you know, that, that's a part of why I'm so passionate about writing this, this book. This book needs to happen. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, I, I knew I was going to get an education. I am completely... And, Deb, we just peeled back a couple of the top layers of I the know. onion. There I know. I know. We haven't even layers. really scratched the surface of yeah. any number of things because then as you were... Describing that, it made me think of, um, again, kind of like back to the economics, and you were talking about the bus, and I was, I am such a proponent, born and raised in Wisconsin, but lived out east for a long, long time. I relocated in uh, uh, 96, something like that, and just 
public transportation, how lovely. I was telling you, I could go back and forth midtown to Harlem if I wanted to. Uh, <laughs> and then, and why is that, why didn't that cost anything? Well, I learned. But just being a transplant, right, from Wisconsin where you have to drive everywhere. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you said in 1976, things that were just happening in 1976 and it's like oh I got my license <laughs> in, in 76 and mm-hmm. and stuff like that but I also remembered hearing in one of your in one of the available uh, I don't know if it was part of the podcast or, or the, the sound bites um, but you were talking about people wanting to work and not being able to get to get, to job, get so. around and we've had just numerous discussions here at Hello County with regard to, you know, why, why isn't anything happening with mass transit and stuff like that? I, I've got a very long commute mm-hmm. and I know Amtrak comes through. It's literally, it, it, it doesn't make, it doesn't, it's not feasible, mm-hmm. you know, because it's like once a day each direction. I'd have to come the day before, whatever, whatever. It actually costs more than the gas, which that's saying something. Yeah. And, and how Wisconsin, you know, is just so dug in. You know, the fact that uh, at one time the federal government, they had even built the train cars, you know, to, to yeah. increase. Yeah, you know they, what I'm they, talking they, about, they right? They promised, you know, we were given hundreds of millions of dollars to build a light rail between Milwaukee and Madison. Right. But Governor Walker turned the money down. Yes, he did. And so one of the chapters of the book is looking at transportation challenges here in Metro Milwaukee because this is what happened. So the manufacturing jobs at first didn't go overseas. They left right, the you were city saying at first they moved kind out of to migrated. the suburbs and then to the exurbs. And so if you look at manufacturing jobs in, in, in Metro Milwaukee, what you've seen since 1980, you've seen a drastic decrease in manufacturing jobs in the city of Milwaukee. There's been a loss of over 50,000 manufacturing jobs in the city of Milwaukee since 1982. 50, over 50,000 in the city. But there's been uh, a loss of about 20,000 in the suburbs within Milwaukee County, but there's been a growth of over 30,000 of those jobs in the exurban counties, Waukesha, Milwaukee, Washington County. So now you think about Milwaukee County transit system. It doesn't take you to Waukesha <laughs> what County. What transit system? Or Ozaukee <laughs> County or Washington County. So people in the city who want access to those jobs, mm-hmm. you know, good jobs, mm-hmm. they, they can't get to the jobs. We don't have a reliable public transportation system. And people have been pushing for decades that for a regional transit authority, mm-hmm. which is how many cities, you know, like New York has a regional transit exactly. system, right? So all of these counties... Yeah, I got rid of my car when I moved from Connecticut into the city. Yeah, you know, all of these counties get together and, and take on the... Uh, you know the the expense of providing you know transit for everybody in their communities because they realize you know you live in in New York right uh, Westchester County you know people who live in Westchester County may may work in the city of New York and a lot do and forth. so you know people need transportation back and forth mm-hmm. so what do they do they combine the resources and they provide transportation to get people back and forth it's healthy for all of those communities all of those counties but Southeast Wisconsin, the seven counties in Southeast Wisconsin, even though people have been trying to convince them to, to, to create a regional transit authority, they just absolutely refuse to do it. And so we're at a point where COVID really impacted Milwaukee County transit system in such a way that they lost so much money that they were on what they call a fiscal cliff and were literally about to lose about 50% of all of the routes in Milwaukee were going to disappear that exist currently. Uh, and so transportation is still a huge challenge to people and as you said you know you have to get in a car to go everywhere mm-hmm. what if you don't have a car exactly what if, what if you don't have a job that gives you the ability to afford to afford a car yeah, like, well and that's insurance. where it, it was the more i learned about it because again i had relocated mid 90s didn't come back into my home state until like 2016 and it's like why is there not you know why is there not commuter rail milwaukee i mean there there is milwaukee chicago right but uh, but why why isn't it madison milwaukee why isn't why isn't it even a rail 
to get everyone from here up to the Packer game. Right. In Green Bay, why is this not developed? And then when a dear friend of mine said, oh, you know, they actually, you know, it was part of this and this and this, and Walker, you know, turned it away, and they actually had the train cars built, and now they're rusting somewhere out west. So um, this would happen. Um, there's a company called Talgo. And it's very conspiratorial. So Talgo was the company that was going to build a light rail train from Milwaukee to Madison, right? So when Governor Walker turned down that federal funding for that, what Talgo did is they opened up a plant in, in Milwaukee in the old A.O. Smith buildings, right? On the grounds of A.O. Smith, they opened up a plant mm -hmm. to not to build a train, but to provide maidens for trains, but not the trains here because we don't have any trains. But they provide the maidens for these trains that they're building for other cities around the country that decide to take advantage of rapid transit. So the city of Milwaukee, Talgo. And I remember the uh, city leaders touted Talgo as, you know, look, we're bringing jobs back to the old A.O. Smith, you know, footprint. And, you know, people were very excited about it. And I remember reading an article about that. And it said at the bottom of the article, it was a very long article, and at the bottom it said how many people they were going to employ at Talgo. You want to guess how many people it was? Now, A.O. Smith employed 11,000 people at its peak. And they were basically almost insinuating that Talgo was going to be replaced right, by A.O. Smith. Right, they were making it sound like, hey, yeah, it's this is going to be the new A.O. Smith. Uh, I mean, given the nature of what you were saying that Telco uh, was going to do, they, I mean, they'd need a few thousand. You know how many people they hired, according to that article? <laughs> how many people they were going to employ when they first opened? 37. I'm sorry? 37. 37. That's what the article said in the paper. That they were going to have 37 jobs available at Telco. Three now, seven. Yeah, three seven. Now I don't know what that number is today, like but okay. you know, I drive past Telco all the time, and the parking lot is very small. It can't be more than 37 or 40 people there. Wow. Now. But that's what city leaders touted as, you know, this is what we're doing to bring jobs back to the city of Milwaukee. So, but had it not been vetoed as as such, had it not been turned away and and whatever and had actual like commuter rail happen <laughs> as was the plan um in theory telco would be busier and also be able yeah. to expand accordingly yeah absolutely i mean they, they would have probably needed I mean, they, thousands they of maintain employees. rail cars so they would have needed thousands <laughs> of employees to build all of the rail right. cars and maintain them right and th this is the other part of that that equation that people don't often think about mm -hmm. not only is it a lack of access to, to to jobs for people in the city of milwaukee to get to where these jobs are but you're beginning to hear particularly over the last five years employers in the ex-urban counties complaining that we can't get workers and now they're looking and at it got like people you know, if we had people effectively landlocked in the, yeah, in the city had, that can't get out if we and, had transportation that would get people out here then huh. we wouldn't have this problem so it's impacting you know these companies and their bottom lines because it's like man we can't we can't find employees because people in the city can't get out here and you know it's something that needs to be resolved in some mm -hmm. way shape or form but as of right now it's just you know Nothing is being done about it. Right at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, how exciting that you're just starting work on the book. Yeah. I bet you have a laundry yeah. list of people to interview. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm starting the book. The first chapter will be suburban stories. Yes. I went into stories of people who live in the suburbs, people who lived in the city and moved to the suburbs, or people who grew up in the suburbs. Because to me, that's the essence of what makes Milwaukee so different from other highly segregated communities. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the demographics of Milwaukee County, we have the lowest percentage of blacks in a county living outside of the city in the suburbs of any of the highly segregated metropolitan areas in the country. Mm -hmm. So literally only 10% of black people in Milwaukee County live outside the city of Milwaukee in the 18 suburbs that wrap around the city, only 10%. You go to Cook County, Illinois, and you have 33% of blacks in Cook County don't live in the city of Chicago. Mm -hmm. You go to Cleveland, Cuyahoga County, 51% of blacks in Cuyahoga County don't live in the central city of Cleveland. Sure. They live in the suburbs. You go to Detroit, I think it's like 20, 24% of blacks in Wayne County don't mm -hmm. live in the city of Detroit. They live in the suburbs, mm -hmm. including my dad who lives in the suburbs mm -hmm. outside Detroit. 
uh, Buffalo, New York is another hotly segregated place. Yeah. Isn't it? yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so you know, Milwaukee um, has these issues. And uh, this here's another nugget for you, Deb. Yes. Sixty-one percent of all black people who live in the state of Wisconsin live in the city of Milwaukee. Sixty-one percent. And yet those dismal numbers. With, okay, a lot of catching up to do. I don't even know if you can speak to this at this particular moment, but um, we've easily identified a lot of problems, <laughs> a lot of issues, a lot of systemic, institutionalized, a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, possible solutions? Yeah, so part of the work that I'm doing with the redress movement, the redress movement was created with the express intent of working to mitigate the damage caused by segregation policies and practices. So holding institutions accountable for the damage that they created and creating new opportunities to mitigate, you know, the damage that was done to families and individuals. So, you know, we're looking at doing things like asking institutions to contribute to a redress fund mm -hmm. uh, that will allow people who are, you know, who want to become homeowners mm -hmm. to get down payment assistance, down payment and closing cost assistance so they can become homeowners for the first time in their lives. And wow. getting that funding from you know, organizations that contributed to segregation policies and practices. Mm -hmm. So really holding people accountable and asking them to do something to fix the problems that they caused. And, you know, they're, they're, that's and just that one working? idea. <laughs> that's just one idea. You know, it's, it's going to no, be I a, know, I know, I know. a very long process. But that's just one By simple idea. By the way, we idea. did have a, um, a, an amazing woman who, 30 years in the mortgage industry, and she currently works for nonprofit mortgage and um, they're here in town. Mm -hmm. And I want to say it started in Minneapolis, but they opened a branch here just in the last couple of years. So um, that was, I know that, that, that the purpose of that organization is in fact to be able to, you know, okay, I've got this job, I've got these numbers, we're you know, a dual working family household, but we can never seem to save up the down payment. I know that that is an organization that is dedicated to uh, help connect people yeah, yeah. with um, And those are the types payments. of things that we're looking at is collaborating with organizations like that that have, you know, ideas about how to, how to help people. That's, that's exactly what Redress is all about. It's creating, you know... Partnerships. Uh, partnerships. Multi-racial partnerships that look to elicit change that will be a positive for everybody in the community. Okay, so while, uh, we, again, we haven't even scratched the surface, we are going to take a break. I, uh, I need a pause for the cause. And um, I think uh, at that point, you, you are welcome to stay and join our big topic. <laughs> I'm, I'm giggling because uh, ben, had, ben picked out the big topic today. Mm. What's the big topic? It has to do with math. Math. Ah, oh, okay. There we go. So, uh, so you might you might be hanging out and, and throwing throwing your two cents in there on well, on math. And, I was a and teacher. I did teach math. Well, there we go. Then. As a special ed teacher. So, yeah, I was a teacher you, for eight again, years. Again, you you mentioned wearing a lot of different hats. That one you surprised me with that one. But yeah, I was a teacher um, for eight we, years. We are going to take a little a little break here. Maybe we can convince Reggie to, to stay and hang out, or at least on the God mic or whatever. But from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for joining. And I think we need to work up the eight-part series. I'm not going to be best at I have to best the six-part series because you you you've done more things and added added more hats and a lot of stuff going on. So I think we can do an eight-part series. Richard yeah, I, I, I'd style. be very happy to come back there. Because, Thank you all so much for the invitation. Especially since. Milwaukee County has a lot of catching up to do. <laughs> yeah, you know, there, there are a so, lot of things that are happening right now that are happening at a slower pace than they should. 
you know, Milwaukee County became the first um, municipality in the country to declare racism a public health crisis, and so the county has been working. When did that happen? That was in 2019. Milwaukee County became the first, and now there are over 300 other municipalities around the country that declare racism a public health crisis, and they're working on plans to to do something about it. So, the Milwaukee County is. I mean, again, on without it. kicking off an entire other new segment, I'm I'm assuming you had some involvement. Yes. Yes, I was That's involved. That's why we're going to have the eight-part series versus yeah. the six-part series. Yeah, I was involved in helping to do some of the training for the equity equity work that the county was doing. Nice. And actually, Fran Kaplan and I created some training videos from Milwaukee County to use in that equity work. Huh. Excellent. Okay. So, um, from the bottom of my heart, and all of us here at Hello County, thank you so much for You're joining welcome. us today. And come back. Yeah, I'll certainly be back. Okay. I look forward we to the so invitation much to, to learn. Come back. And, and on that note, uh, Engineer Dan, if you'd take us out for a pause for the cause, that would be awesome. Stay tuned, everyone.